Brook. My forecast, yummy. Some of the best chefs spill the beans on family secrets to get you ready for Thanksgiving. Then fun. Bringing the heat for the holidays. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts. Oh, cranberry sauce. The eternal question, canned or homemade? Probably one of the biggest debates of the Thanksgiving meal. And while for some, this dish might be the last thing you really even think about when you're prepping your Thanksgiving meal, our next chef has a recipe so enticing that it just may convince you to serve cranberries as your main course. His name, Sean Sherman, a James Beard award-winning chef, also a member of the Oglala Lakota tribe, Raised in Pine Ridge, South Dakota, currently living in Minneapolis, Minnesota, Chef Sean is committed to showing people some of the incredible dishes that can be made with foods indigenous to this continent. Today, he's going to take us through one of his favorite recipes, Rojape, a traditional sauce made out of berries. Now, while a lot of different kinds of berries can be used in this dish today, we're going to use cranberry and rosehip. It's a recipe that's sure to not only change the way we consider cranberries, but teach us something as well. Sean, thanks so much for joining us today on Cooking Up a Storm. Thanks for having me. Really appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, uh, here's the thing. This dish is, is not only gorgeous, but it is delicious as well. And, and it seems to me that it would be a very versatile uh, kind of recipe in that you can pair this with different things. Uh, today, we've got this wonderful cornbread-like uh, meal, uh, but what what are some of the other pairings that this could go with? Well, I mean, it's just a sauce, so I feel like there's no rules. You can do whatever you want to with it. Mm -hmm. You can use it for leftovers the next day. You can make a salad dressing with it. You can uh, freeze it and make a sorbet. You can do all those things. This is something you grew up with. Your grandmother uh, would, would make this, uh, wojape, which it's a Lakota word. Uh, but using a different berry, uh, what would she? How would she make it? What berries would she use? Well, we traditionally use choke cherries because the choke cherry trees grew all over the plains around the Badlands and Black Hills in South Dakota. So we harvested a ton of choke cherries, and then they would just cook it down with water and sweeten it if it needs to be sweetened a little bit. But for me, that aroma just sends me right back to being five years old. You've got uh, this terrific restaurant in, uh, in in Minneapolis. What berries do you use for your wojape in that restaurant? At our restaurant called Awamni by the Sioux Chef, spelled S-I-O-U-X, <laughs> <laughs> Um, we use all sorts of berries. We've been using aronia berries, choke cherries, cranberries, blackberries, mm -hmm. blueberries, um, you know, both wild and domesticated. But we also utilize a lot of wild foods out there too. Lots of conifers and trees, lots of wild herbs like hyssop and bergamot. And there's so much to explore when you start looking around the world and seeing all these plants with all these great tastes and flavors. I feel like the Western diets never really touched like the amazing flavors of where we are here. Is this in a sense a seasonal dish in that using different berries that are uh, native and are in season at different times. Absolutely. I feel like this is a perfect time, you know, into the fall season because cranberries come out around that time, September, mm -hmm. October, and the rose hips are best when they're drying up and the leaves are turning color and they get a little bit sweeter. So that's a good time to harvest them in the wild if you know what to look for. Um, so I feel like it's a very fall recipe. This food and the food you prep is that it, in a sense, it's what would have been foraged. Yeah, we just try to make food taste like where we might be. So in I'm in Minneapolis around the Great Lakes where there's lots of woods and lakes. And, you know, I could if I find a cranberry bog, um, there will be some rose hips along the lake shore and there'll be maple trees around there, too. So all those ingredients are living together right there. And it's fun to think about that, mm -hmm. of, you know, what were indigenous peoples utilizing for food and what was in their pantries and what were the flavors that they were playing with to create all sorts of recipes. <laughs> Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Hey, I'm Hallie. It's good to be with you tonight. There's another legal filing today, and I want to cut through some of the weedsy stuff. And let's just, like, get to the point. They have started to vote on the PACT Act. If you're like, Hallie, stop speaking Washingtonese. This bill would basically give health care to veterans who have exposed to these toxic chemicals. So Scott, I'm trying to make this as not D.C. as possible. The increased sort of anger that we've seen now in politics. I saw you searching for, I think, your microphone, Dan. Yeah. You are, oh, I was you trying got it. to do it on the slide. Live TV, man. It's okay. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now.
and good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Sean, what, what are rose hips? I, I just, uh, all I can think of is like a flower that looks like Elvis singing, but uh, I'm, I'm sure it has nothing to do with that. What, what are rose hips? So if you know what a rose plant looks like, right. um, you'll find these little red kind of uh, blossom pieces on there. And as they dry up, they get really sweet and tart, and it's a wonderful flavor. So I harvest a lot of wild foods in the forests and on the Great Plains, because that's kind of the area that I live in. And there's rose hips all over the place, and they're really fun to harvest. And, you know, there's thorns. So you have to be a little bit careful. <laughs> <laughs> picking them. Um, and there's a lot of seeds in them, so they take a little bit of work. Um, but there's uh, plenty of places to find dried rose hips that are uh, seeded and sifted and mm -hmm. easy to use. And you can literally just pour some hot water out over those and it'll turn into a, a rose hip jam within moments. So that's a, it's a wonderful little piece. And if you don't have rose hips, what would you substitute that? You can use whatever you want to. I mean, like I said, when I grew up, wojapi was choke cherry, but we use lots of mixed berries. So you can do cranberry and blueberry. You can do cranberry and blackberry, cranberry and strawberry, like whatever makes you happy. So, uh, Sean, is there a particular dish that uh, goes with wojapi? Well, when I was growing up, it was fry bread, which actually has a lot of uh, interesting history, too, <laughs> when it comes from colonized foods. Um, but, uh, you know, I just love it with vegetables. I love it with this cornbread that we're serving with it today. And I think it's pretty much good on whatever you want to. We would just eat it straight when I was a kid. So It seems like awamni would be, in a sense, of the moment right now, in that uh, a plant-based diet is has never been probably more popular and gaining more acceptance. Uh, is, is that, was that just a happy accident for you guys? You know, we celebrate a lot of plant-based foods. Um, I myself um, eat largely a plant-based diet and it was easy for us to celebrate plants um, because we cut out dairy. So there's no cheese and all that stuff in our food. So if it didn't have meat on it particularly, then it was completely plant-based. So over half the menu ended up being plant-based like that. And, you know, it's good because you eat that food and you feel healthy. It mm -hmm. uh, agrees with your stomach and your body and it makes your mind happy. Yeah, what are some of the goals of your, your new restaurant, Awamni, in, in Minneapolis? It's really to showcase that a modern indigenous restaurant can exist in this world. I feel like we should have indigenous restaurants in every single city because we're in these food capitals like Manhattan, like Chicago, like, uh, you know, and there's zero Native American restaurants, which is insane because no matter where we are, we're standing on indigenous land and we should be, there should be healthy and happy representation of indigenous cultures and showcasing that diversity and celebrating that diversity through food and through story. We're talking about this dish for uh, Thanksgiving, which, you know, for the indigenous peoples of our country, it's got to be a complicated holiday. It absolutely is. I mean, because if you look at the the Pilgrim and the Indian story, you know, there's a lot of erasure going on. It's kind of like, remember that time we had you over for dinner a few hundred years ago? You know, <laughs> it doesn't talk about all of the uh, really intense trauma that happened to indigenous peoples, especially in the 17 and 1800s and even, you know, through the 1900s. And so there's a lot of repair work to do. Um, and we shouldn't be celebrating those stories that uh, really have no basis in reality. Uh, but we can be celebrating holidays to come together as people and as families and to celebrate food and why not celebrate the food of the land you're standing on for you growing up what was your relationship i mean i try to imagine what it would be like because again having grown up in this country uh but you know again uh, you know as as a black american having you know a complicated relationship um but for you a, a holiday one of our central holidays in this country um, based on, in, in a sense, this, this mythology that wasn't correct. Were you aware of that? Does it, did it make it a difficult time for you to celebrate growing up? You know, it's, it's just complicated, like you said. So some some family really embraced it and really loved the the whole dinner, the whole classical dinner. And others were really upset about the whole story for obvious reasons. And so, so I have lots of family members that won't celebrate Thanksgiving particularly because of that. But I feel like we can grow out of that. I feel like we can move forward with it. I feel like that particular holiday doesn't have to carry that mythology with it. Mm -hmm. And we don't have to single out an entire culture with an untrue story. 
So here we are, 2021. Uh, what role do you think Thanksgiving plays today, or should it play? It should really be a celebration of harvest. It should be a celebration of coming together. It should be a celebration of being thankful and looking forward and just, you know, being with people that we love and uh, missing the people that can't be there with us. A number of folks uh, that we've talked to on this podcast have talked about that, 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 that Thanksgiving for them tends to be their favorite holiday because at its core, especially today, it's more about not so much what happened in the past, but what's happening now and why we are thankful. And and it doesn't have a religious connotation. It is not about gift giving. It is just about celebrating what you what you are thankful for. That's what it should be for, you know, and it shouldn't have this kind of nationalistic kind of uh, touch to it, you know, of celebrating, um, again, uh, this this pilgrims and Indians coming together situation where everything's good because it's not that simple. Like there's a lot of things that we should address in our society of how this country was built and things that we need to do better to move forward. Mm -hmm. um, and again, just it's celebrating more diversity, inclusivity, um, I think is going to be more important. And learning about a food's history or, or the importance that an indigenous food uh, played in this country and continues to play. Does that does that food history uh, bring us or can it bring us closer together? I feel like it can because I feel like if people truly understand how countless communities were surviving for thousands of generations before anybody else showed up on this land space and all the amazing diversity of food and flavor that was out there, there's so much to learn. You know, when you look at some of these bases, like the, the corn, the wild rice, the cranberry, the maple, the rose hips, all those are from these regions, you know, and there's so much history behind there and there's so much connection to indigenous peoples with these foods and we should be learning about those stories. It'll help open us up. Mm -hmm. For you, uh, what are you thankful for this year? <laughs> I'm thankful for everything that we're able to do. I'm thankful for the work that we have, for the team that's behind us. I'm thankful for uh, being around all this wonderful food. I'm thankful for all these opportunities to tell these stories. And I, I will tell you, uh, I think what is unique about Wojape that I don't think any other uh, dish that we've prepared during this podcast, I, I think that is the one thing that literally can be from start to finish in a meal. It could be in an appetizer, it could be part of an entree, could be a dessert. I mean, this is probably the Swiss army knife <laughs> of Thanksgiving food. It's extremely versatile, of course, yeah. And again, like there's no rules, you can do whatever you want to with it. I like that for Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving, no rules, Oh, jape. You get one beautiful life to live. What are you going to do? This show is so fun, but having you as a positive force means really the world to me. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold, okay? We have this circle of women that love each other. I decided I'm going to go with the rhythm of life. And you love riding the I wave. Love riding. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. I love you. I love you too. <laughs> One beautiful life to live. What are you gonna do? This show is so fun, but having you as a positive force means really the world to me. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold, okay? We have this circle of women that love each other. I decided I'm gonna go with the rhythm of life. And you love riding the I love riding. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. I love you. I love you too. <laughs> Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Thank so you. thrilled to have you. I, and, you know, look, I don't think people realize 
uh, what a real food town uh, Minneapolis is. Mm -hmm. and, and you found this, this place with your, your uh, restaurant, Alumni. Tell me about it. Well, we are right on the Mississippi River mm -hmm. and we're right on a really sacred Dakota space because there used to be this beautiful waterfall right in that area, right downtown Minneapolis. And it was called Awamni Yamni by the Dakota people. And we took the short name Awamni to celebrate this beautiful place to showcase what is modern indigenous food um, and really kind of utilizing a lot of wild foods around us and making food taste like where we are. And Sean, I, th I think what we're making today is basically central to your restaurant. You don't use uh, what you call colonized ingredients. Explain that. Well, we cut out ingredients that weren't from here, so we removed things like dairy, wheat flour, cane sugar, beef, pork, chicken, things that were introduced to these lands. And we really focus on what were the foods of where we were or where we are. Um, so we utilize a lot of wild foods, a lot of native agriculture products like corns, beans, squash, maple, pieces like that. And just again, like try to make food taste like where we are and put a lot of representation into the indigenous cultures of that region. Which I think is, is really important coming up for Thanksgiving. Uh, what are we making? This is kind of a cranberry sauce, but a different take. What is? What are you making? It's just really simple because we're just utilizing cranberries, and we're utilizing rose hips, and mm -hmm. we're utilizing maple, and all three of those things live together. So you can find a cranberry bog in the you know in the Great Lakes regions, and you can look around and find wild roses and find maple trees, and all those ingredients live together right there. And and the dish is called. Well, Wojapi is what Wojapi. we call it. Traditionally for us, we mm -hmm. utilize choke cherry uh, as a berry sauce for that piece. How do we start this? All right, well, all we're gonna do basically is just put everything in a pot mm -hmm. <laughs> and let it go. Wow, this <laughs> is gonna be a tough one. It's, it's a pretty simple recipe. Um, and all of these, uh, both the rose hips and the and cranberries have so much natural pectin that just thickens up so nicely. Now, in rose hips, where do you get rose hips? Uh, well, you can find rose hips online. You can find them at some uh, health food stores. Uh -huh. um, but we harvest a lot of them wild because they're all around the lakes, they're all around the forest, um, they're all around the plains. Um, they're, they're, you know, it's just, it's good. We try to entice people to learn about the plants of their regions, mm -hmm. and there's so much food and medicine and stuff that we can be doing with this. And some natural sweeteners really go really well with this stuff. And some maple syrup. And it's the simplest recipe in the world because it's just, everybody has cranberries on their Thanksgiving table. Mm -hmm. right? And this is just looking at it through a different lens. Um, we even put things like uh, cedar or pine or something to give it a little flavor of the oh, forest of where we are, yeah. Uh, so, so you're using frozen cranberries, but you could, you, could you use fresh? Oh, absolutely, because fresh cranberry season is great when it's here, and we utilize a lot of them, but the frozen cranberries, non-sugared, are so good, you know? Wow, you know, you know it's funny you used to talk about cedar. I, I had made a recipe this past holiday season that called for a, uh, a, a pine simple syrup, and I never thought that, you know, you just clean off the Christmas tree, <laughs> and, and you boil it with sugar and water, and you end up with a, a wonderful aromatic syrup. Absolutely, like we serve a lot of wild teas, like uh, white cedar tea, sumac tea, pine tea, spruce tea, balsam fir tea, um, and those flavors are really wonderful, and they're all around us, mm -hmm. you know, especially where I'm at in Minnesota, where there's uh, so much forest and lakes there. Now, how long will you cook this down? You only need to cook this for about 15 minutes, really, mm -hmm. and uh, it comes, you know, you can kind of cook it to where you feel like the consistency is gonna be where you want it to be. So we've got some over here that's that's already been simmering. How do you do? You, do you want a, a a smooth consistency? And if so, how do you how do you make that happen? I feel like it's really a matter of preference because these things will break up so easily on their own, and you can break them up with just a whisk. Mm -hmm. um, but if you happen to have um, an immersion blender and you want a really smooth sauce, ah. then you're able to just buzz this up really quickly and carefully. And you want to be really careful, of course, because it's hot liquid and you don't want to spray uh, everywhere. So. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. You know, I'm looking at this, and you, you know, it, it would almost seem like if you had leftovers, you could freeze this and almost make a sorbet. Absolutely, yep, the same, same situation, because it's just the simplest of sauces. You can put it on sandwiches, you can, you know, put it on, use it as a salad dressing once uh, it's cold. Oh, wow. You can do all sorts of stuff. And you can smell a little bit of that rose mm -hmm. hip and the cranberry that kind of sets it aside. Oh, yeah. How did you come up with this? <laughs> 
Well, it was just the simplest of ingredients. So cra basic cranberry sauce is just that, cooking some cranberries in some water. Adding the rose hips, I think, adds a little bit more thickness and sheen to it and mm -hmm. a little uh, floralness. Uh, um, you're just using a natural sweetener like maple or maybe agave or something like that. Just really kind of brings it out. So it doesn't need to be a big sugary sauce, you mm -hmm. know, because the, the fruit itself has a lot of flavor. And then w what are we serving this with? So we make these little husk breads um, at our restaurant, and it's just really simple because it's literally just uh, dried corn that's uh, cooked and then ground into a, a corn dough. And we're actually using some of this puffed wild rice. So we just take mm. wild rice, because where we are in Minnesota, we have true wild rice growing around all the lakes. There's mm -hmm. like, you know, 15,000 lakes in Minnesota, and there's so much of this. And we just dry toast it, and it just makes a nice little snack. Oh, this is toast. So you eat it just Yeah, like you can eat it just like that. Oh, that's crunchy. Yeah, it's good. It's good. And then so this stuff, you just add a little bit of sauce. Mm -hmm. Like so. So these little corn packets have uh, wild rice, a little bit of fresh corn, dried corn. And it's well, just so simple. And again, you know, because of what we do, we're gluten-free, dairy-free, sugar-free, soy-free, pork-free, you name it. So, <laughs> <laughs> And it's healthy and it tastes good. I mean, it's almost like a, almost like a jam jelly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, super simple, super, super simple. Better than the canned stuff. I was going to say, is, is, is food the great uniter? It really is, because we all have food in common, and you know, cultural food is something that's really important. It's our identity. You know, we think about our parents and our grandparents and the foods that they pass down. And you know, I want to see a world where we can find indigenous restaurants all over the nation celebrating the history and the land of where that might be. Well, this is terrific. This is something to give thanks for. Awesome. This is wonderful. Sean, thank, thank you, you so, so much. much. Yeah. Hey, I'm Hallie. It's good to be with you tonight. There's another legal filing today, and I want to cut through some of the weedsy stuff. And let's just, like, get to the point. They have started to vote on the PACT Act. If you're like, Hallie, stop speaking Washingtonese. This bill would basically give health care to veterans who have exposed to these toxic chemicals. Just got, I'm trying to make this as not D.C. as possible. The increased sort of anger that we've seen now in politics. I saw you searching for, I think, your microphone, Danny. You are, oh, I was you trying got it. to do it on the slide. Live TV, man. It's okay. Hey, I'm Hallie. It's good to be with you tonight. There's another legal filing today, and I want to cut through some of the weedsy stuff. But let's just, like, get to the point. They have started to vote on the PACT Act. If you're like, Hallie, stop speaking Washingtonese. This bill would basically give health care to veterans who have exposed to these toxic chemicals. Just got, I'm trying to make this as not D.C. as possible. The increased sort of anger that we've seen now in politics. I saw you searching for, I think, your microphone, Danny. You are, oh, you got it. I trying to do it on the slide. Live TV, man, it's okay. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight and expert analysis. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. start with you and the yes. Roker family. What's the, the history with the sweet potato? Well, my mother has always always made this, and, uh, you know, uh, and it, it, we still make it kind of in her memory. Yeah. And you can use any sweet potatoes. Sweet potatoes, yams, you've got white sweet potatoes, uh, Japanese, any number of them all have a little bit of a different flavor. But you basically peel them down, and then you cut them up uh, into, like, about two-inch size cubes. Now, I, I have done a little uh, a variation of this where I cut them up into slightly smaller cubes and then actually roasted them, and it gives it a slightly nuttier flavor. But you're basically like going to put these in, boil them for about 10, 12 minutes till they get nice and soft, and then once that happens, uh, you let them cool off, and you've got uh, a little butter. Just a little. Just a little bit. Just a little butter. <laughs> you've got some flour. Mm -hmm. uh, you've got some brown sugar. Okay, so this is healthy. This is, is, yeah, there's nothing good about this. Okay. Uh, you've got uh, pineapple. Uh, pine, crushed oh. pineapple. Pineapple. And then oh, what are the spices? That's, it. that's the secret. Yeah, the pineapple. pineapple. And then you've got nutmeg, brown, uh, uh, some cloves, some uh, salt, and uh, some cinnamon. You put it all in. You mash it up till it's in a rough. You don't want it smooth. You just mash it yeah. so that's kind of rough. So you, you don't even use the electric mixer. You no, just, use the just masher. mash your uh, just a nice work. 
work out. Did you, you guys have this only the holidays? Or yeah, just... my mother would only make it uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas. Oh, cool. Then you bake it for about 30 minutes at 350, and then you line it with marshmallows. And mm. you line that up. You put it under the broiler for very quickly. Yes. you, you got to watch it. Burn that. Every year, we would distract my mom so that they would catch fire. <laughs> yeah. oh, so we always bought two bags of Jet Puff marshmallows. <laughs> okay. And we also, cornbread, you can do it two ways. Uh, we like this a little jalapeno cheddar yeah. or mm. your plain corn. Very good. Wow, that's delicious. I never liked the yams at Thanksgiving, as you know. That's yeah. But this, I could get behind. Absolutely. Mm. I that looks delicious. How is it, guys? Fantastic. Yummy. Fantastic. Good? Fantastic. Yeah, delicious. And you can, you, if you take the marshmallows off, you could kind of make it a, more like a side dish than a dessert. You don't want to take the marshmallows yeah. off, though. All right. Yeah. Bingo, what do you have? Okay, what? so I'm going to make an autumn panzanella. And panzanella is basically a bread salad. Mm -hmm. So um, we're going to start with um, this butternut squash. It's, it has all sorts of fall vegetables in it. What does um, panzanella mean? What is that? It's a bread salad. She bread just salad? Yes. I'm sorry. I did just say that. Thank you, Chris. Does he listen to you at home? No, there was somebody <laughs> in the studio <laughs> talking. I couldn't. Okay. Sorry, I couldn't. So you just scoop it out, and then you're going to slice it again, like, like, the turn, like you did. In so the, you peeled it? So yes. Peeled it I have and, selective hearing, I <laughs> That's absolutely true. Um, <laughs> little cubes mm -hmm. over here. So we right. have them all cubed. We've got some tomatoes, some Brussels sprouts. We're going to put That's some olive oil. Now, who made this? Gigi made this? Who in your family? Yes. My mom loves a good pan. Did the kids enjoy eating this around the holidays? Actually, yeah, because... And by the kids, she means you. Yeah, I mean, anything with bread in it, I'm, like, mm -hmm. I'm a big... You made, you made a, a big version of this loader, just last right week. Now. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so salt and pepper, and then you're going to roast these about 20 minutes or so, oh, 400 degrees, just mm -hmm. until they get kind of caramelized, um, fork tender. You don't want to overcrowd that, because then they won't get caramelized. Right. So, sure. And now we're going to fry up some pancetta, Ooh. as mm -hmm. one would. Um, you cube the uh, pancetta. And this will just add a little crisp to the top. If you can't get is, pancetta, could you use you just could like use bacon. bacon? Yeah, absolutely. Mm. I just love pancetta. And this is just going to, I love like the texture of the salad mm -hmm. with the bread and the crispy pancetta. Another thing That's we're going to add, we're going to let this saute What's... for a little bit. And then we're going to add sage, which Ooh. will give it such a Delicious. yummy mm. autumn. What dressing do you use on this? Okay, so now we're going to make the dressing. We've got Dijon mustard right here. Mm -hmm. We'll add some red wine vinegar, some maple syrup. More How's the, the salad? yummy fall it's flavor. Great. Evan, I finished Siri, it. Good, right? What it's is delicious. panzanella? <laughs> we're going to rewind. <laughs> Just one question. Oh, Sandy. <laughs> oh, Sandy. Um, yeah, and then you'll add some olive oil slowly. That's how it gets nice and thick. Nice. And then there, this is your bread mm -hmm. that makes it a panzanella. Yeah. Ah. Hoda, it's a panzanella. Oh, bread salad. Um, Carson, what are you doing in the kitchen while all this is? I make drink. the cocktails. Absolutely. This, if you came to my house, this Ooh. is my mother's handwriting Aww. of the recipe, which That's we so always sweet. loved her handwriting. And Siri had this made on a towel that sits oh, in our kitchen. Oh, beautiful. beautiful. Yeah. So this was cool. That's and uh, it's a Brandy Alexander, mm. and I'll make it when we're done. Are you done with the salad? I'm done, yes. Go for it. <laughs> this was, <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is a cocktail on. that started in our household, really just around Christmas for Thanksgiving, but then it became like the drink in the house. And we use it at every celebration, birthdays and whatnot. And it's a very simple recipe, as my mom has written out here. So it's always fun. We got to... It's one and a half cups of brandy to a cup of cream to cocoa. So that's the ratio. And then mm. a little, and then a cup of half and half. Mm. That's basically it. I've added, we added ice right. somewhere along the line. Uh, I added a scoop of vanilla ice cream to my mom's recipe. <laughs> so it's a, yeah. it's just, very a little bowel thruster. Yeah, very it. light. Just a little bit. Uh, and, uh, good yeah. for the kids, too, right? <laughs> uh, no, this is not. Although, yeah, you can make the, the mocktail version of that. My first Christmas with the dailies, uh, I had a dangerous <laughs> amount of those. These get, know. yeah, these get going. So anyway, you, you, you do. <laughs> It should be like a milkshake consistency, mm -hmm. though. And then we take a little bit of nutmeg right on top. This oh. was such a big part of our family that we had a dog. Uh, we named the dog Brandy Alexander because it was a white little fluffy dog with a little bit of brown right here, like uh, nutmeg. Aww. And we called her Lexi. So Aww. this, this is a very, very big daily household cocktail, the Brandy Alexander. Grab your apron for a new podcast, Cooking Up a Storm with Al Roker. My forecast, yummy. Some of the best chefs spill the beans on family secrets to get you ready for Thanksgiving. This is fun. Bringing the heat for the holidays. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts.
Alrighty, dear listeners, we've reached that part of the meal that for many is the piece de resistance of a Thanksgiving spread, the bird. So to tackle such a monumental dish, we have brought in one of the culinary world's true rising stars, chef and writer Sola El Whaley. Now, you may have seen some of her very popular YouTube videos on a variety of channels, including New York Times Cooking. She also has a new show on history titled Ancient Recipes with Sola. Not only is Sola known for creating inventive recipes, but she has an undeniable warmth that truly shines no matter where she is. And today, I am thrilled she's able to join us on Cooking Up a Storm to walk us through her recipes for crisp and juicy herb roasted turkey and honey thyme gravy. Almost sounds like a, an old time and honey thyme gravy. Well, so well, <laughs> welcome. Good to see you, honey thyme. Happy to be here. I must tell you, this, this uh, uh, recipe is, is a revelation to me. It, 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 <laughs> it, it's tender, it's crisp, it's flavorful, uh, and, and it's all because you, A, dry brine your turkey mm-hmm. and you spatchcock it. So mm-hmm. why? Okay. So the dry brine... We, we touched on it a little bit before, but it does so many amazing things to the turkey. A dry brine, it sounds like complicated, but you're just putting salt on something and letting it hang out. What happens is as the salt sits on the meat, the, the meat juices dissolves the salt and then it gets drawn into the meat. And then that's going to tenderize the meat fibers by actually dissolving some of the meat fibers into like a gel. So when it cooks up, it's going to be really tender, more forgiving if you accidentally overcook it. Mm. and of course, it's going to season it, so it tastes really good. And then the best part is that the fat on the skin kind of breaks down a little bit. The skin gets really dry, and then you get, like, super, super crispy, like, shattery skin. And, and what's interesting is that once you dry brine it, you leave it uncovered mm-hmm. in the fridge. Mm-hmm. For how long? A turkey is really, really big, so at least 24 hours, but I think 48 is, like, perfect. Just let it go. Forget about it. Set it and forget Set it. Set it and forget it. There you go. Now, when you when you talk about turkey, you say that, you know, what you start with is what you're going to finish with. So mm-hmm. if you start with a good heritage turkey, you're going to end up with a really tasty turkey. Yeah, I think that you should try and get, like, the best quality turkey that you can afford. They can get expensive. Maybe you need less turkey per person. Mm-hmm. But it's going to be a lot tastier. Um, a lot of those conventional brands are injected with brine, which just means they're plumped up with water. I try and get the best turkey you can find, organic heritage, but you know, you don't have to break the bank, just invite less people. And here's the thing, I think, well, I, I do agree with the invite less people part, but that's another story. <laughs> Hopefully none of my family's listening. But uh, I, I also think we tend to want to give people a lot. When mm-hmm. they're, they're, it, at Thanksgiving, it's more about the sides than it is, in a Definitely. sense, the turkey. So yeah. you don't need a lot of turkey. No, you don't need a lot. Just try and make sure it's good, yeah. right? I feel like a lot of times the turkey ends up being the most disappointing thing on the table because you get something. You know those turkeys that have, like, the thermometer in it that yeah. pops? Yeah, the pop-up thing. Those are a lie. They, they are. If they only pop at, like, when the turkey is so overcooked, it's like cardboard. Ah, you know, don't 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 waste your time with that. Get the good turkey. Temp it yourself. When I bite into your turkey, it's not only a, a moist and and just juicy and succulent, but it is very flavorful. What what is causing that? It's just because we didn't dilute the flavor. Because mm-hmm. um, we started with the good bird that wasn't injected with brine, and then we didn't do a wet brine. Because a, a lot of recipes tell you to dunk your turkey in this wet brine, which is like water and salt and your turkey is just going to absorb water so this we're keeping that turkey flavor really really concentrated Mm -hmm. and so it just it tastes more like turkey oh and then there's a secret ingredient right the msg ah the msg MSG, which is in the rub there's a little bit of msg in the rub it's you don't need very much msg is one of those things where just a little bit makes a huge difference and it makes your, your turkey tastes more like turkey it just makes things more savory so if you're cooking something that's already savory like tomato sauce or Anything with cheese, any kind of meat, just like a pinch of MSG makes it taste more like itself. Good. A lot of people, because MSG's gotten, in your opinion, a bad rap. Unfairly. Unfairly. uh, None of the scientific studies have shown that there's any negative effects from eating MSG. I like science. So you you shouldn't (laughs) have a big handful of it, but, you know, just a little sprinkle. A little sprinkle here and there. It just makes everything taste better. What are the, what's the one mistake when it comes to the turkey that we make? Hmm, I think cooking it whole. 
-hmm. and putting stuffing in it, trying to get that picture perfect turkey. The stuffing dries it out because all of that flavorful turkey juice just gets absorbed into the stuffing. And then when you cook it whole, it doesn't cook as evenly. When you flatten out your turkey and spatchcock it, what happens is the legs get a little bit more heat just because of just the design. And then your legs need a little bit, little bit more heat. You they're need, going to take longer to cook. They take a little longer to cook. So that way they get a little bit more heat. That connective tissue has a t chance to break down. And your breast, which is in the center, is a little bit more protected. When you cook your turkey whole, the breast is getting all of the heat. Yeah, because it it's up high. Out. It's up high. It's getting all that attention. And it should be like a little bit protected, you know? Wow. I, I, you, you've actually, after t having tasted this, and I, I've been a huge proponent uh, if, if you've listened to this, and there's no reason why you would have, but uh, to to uh, stuff the turkey. I'm a big, I like the stuffing, mm -hmm. and, the, and probably you've now explained why I like the stuffing in the turkey, because it absorbs all the flavor of the turkey. You can make a really tasty stuffing on the side if you get some really good bone broth and just like add it to your stuffing mix. It's going to taste like it was cooked in a turkey. Wow. You can have, you can have it all. You are. Can I have it all? You can, any, we can all have it all, at least one day a year. Okay, that's all I've been asking for. That's all I... <laughs>
the everything was like from a box, but it was delicious. And the canned cranberry sauce and all that. And that was the meal that we had almost every single year until I got older and I started to make things from scratch. But yeah, like the, oh, I loved the green bean casserole with the soup from the oh, can. Oh, yeah, and the, and, the, and the French fried onions. The French fried onions, yeah. We, we did all the classics, and I loved it because I loved feeling like everyone in the country was, like, doing the same thing. You were sh- It was a shared experience. Yeah, yeah. Hey, I'm Hallie. It's good to be with you tonight. There's another legal filing today, and I want to cut through some of the weedsy stuff. But let's just, like, get to the point. They have started to vote on the PACT Act. If you're like, Kelly, stop speaking Washingtonese. This bill would basically give health care to veterans who have exposed to these toxic chemicals. Scott, I'm trying to make this as not D.C. as possible. The increased sort of anger that we've seen now in politics. I saw you searching for, I think, your microphone, Danny. Yeah. You are I was you trying to do it on the slide. Live TV, man. It's OK. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. You get one beautiful life to live. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold. We have this circle of women that love each other. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Love you. (laughs) Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. You get one beautiful life to live. What are you going to do? This show is so fun, but having you as a positive force means really the world to me. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold, okay? We have this circle of women that love each other. I decided I'm gonna go with the rhythm of life. And you love riding the way. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Love you. Yeah. <laughs> Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Hey, podcast fans, ready to unlock our true crime mysteries? Try Dateline Premium on Apple Podcasts. You'll get early access to originals, plus bonus content, and everything is ad-free. So head to Apple Podcasts now to subscribe. So we're, we're doing this, this, this spatchcocking, and mm-hmm. you are uh, dry brining yes. the turkey. Very important. Why, now, why is that important? So by dry brining, what you're doing is, it, it sounds a lot more complicated than it is. You're just going to sprinkle salt and whatever else you want on there. And mm-hmm. then what happens is, it takes time. As it sits in the fridge, the salt on the surface of the turkey is going to dissolve. And it creates a really concentrated brine with just the salt and the turkey juices that then gets sucked into the turkey. Mm-hmm. And then it does three really cool things. First, obviously, it's going to season it and make it delicious. Right. But it also kind of breaks down some of those muscle fibers, mm-hmm. creating a bit of a gel. So it's it stays, a little more tender? It stays, it's really tender, mm-hmm. really juicy, and mm-hmm. there's less worry about overcooking it. It's just going to be a bit more forgiving. Okay. And then I think the best part about the dry brine is it's going to dry out the surface of the skin and break down the fat so you get really crispy skin. Crispy. Ooh. Crispy. Crispy. All right. I'm very excited about this. So so what, uh, how do we start? How do we start to prep this? Okay. So first the dry brine. Mm-hmm. So I- I'm keeping it really, really simple. Okay. It's just salt, yes. a little bit of sugar that helps with the browning okay. and a touch of MSG, you know. That's a good thing. That's a good thing. That's we a want our turkey thing. to taste like turkey. Uh, I mean, please. But you can add spices to this. I like to keep it simple because mm-hmm. especially if you're doing like a potluck and you have a bunch of friends coming. Yeah. So now you're going to show us how to smash cut. Yeah. Okay. So th- we've got like a 12 to 14 pound turkey. I think mm-hmm. you don't want to get bigger than that because that's when it starts to cook really unevenly. So if you have a lot of people, make two turkeys. Okay. Yeah. So spatchcock, super easy. We're going to flip this over. Okay. Boom. And we're going to cut out the backbone. And then we can open it up and kind of like butterfly it. So I'm just going to use kitchen shears. Right. And we're going to do a little snippety. We're going to get through those bones. Okay. Strong after oh, that. I feel like I'm gonna go rip out a transmission of a car. <laughs> okay, so now we're gonna flip it over. Okay. So some people like to remove these uh, wingtips, but mm. I don't bother because that was already a journey, right? Right. So 
So now we're gonna flatten. I gotta take. I gotta take a break. I'm exhausted. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So now I'm gonna get on top and just flatten the breast. Very important. We're gonna dry off our turkey. So the idea is to reduce as much moisture on the on the surface. Totally. Yeah. So we want to get it. Take your time with this part. I'm gonna pat the cutting board dry because I don't want to lose a bunch of dry brine to the board. Okay. Because it's gonna stick to whatever's wet. And then we're gonna get sprinkling on every inch of this turkey, all over, inside, outside. Let's start with this part okay. because we're gonna flip it over. So get every single bit, rain it on. We're Make it rain. Use, we're gonna use all of this. I know it oh. looks like a lot of salt, mm -hmm. but you need it. It's a very big bird, so some of it's gonna fall off. You want to pick it up, get it back on there. Every single inch. Now, when you get your turkey in the oven, or mm -hmm. the, we're gonna let this sit in the fridge. Right. And what's gonna happen is initially, it's gonna get really wet because the salt's gonna- Draw out the moisture. Draw out the moisture. That's the first stage. And then if you let it sit, you let it just keep sitting, it's gonna once again, like get really nice and dry once that salt and moisture gets reabsorbed. Now, when you put it in the fridge, uh, should it be uh, skin side up? Skin side up. Breast side up? Breast side up, uncovered. Mm -hmm. And 24 hours minimum, but like oh. ideally 48. So 48. 48 hours. Could you go 72? Yeah, I have. Okay. So, uh, so it obviously, if, if you are planning ahead for Thanksgiving and you've got a frozen bird, you've oh. got to you've got to play plan way ahead. Way ahead. Get that bird defrosting a week before Thanksgiving. Or maybe start right after right after Halloween. Or maybe right after listening to this podcast. Go uh, buy a turkey. There you go. <laughs> now, do you, are, are you? Uh, a bit of a turkey snob, do you, do you have to have a fresh turkey as opposed to a, a frozen turkey? I think that it's important, like the quality of the turkey you start with is really important, so I try to get a heritage breed. Okay, so I like to keep it really simple. Uh -huh. We're just gonna roast it on a bed of these woody herbs. Whatever you've got, pop it on here. Mm -hmm. So you can get crazy, you could put garlic under there, onion, lemon, but I like to keep it real simple so right. that the sides can kind of shine. Okay. And this is gonna hang out in the fridge, okay. uncovered. 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 For one to two days. Yes. And you're gonna take it out. Now, how long do you leave it out mm -hmm. uh, before you put it in the oven? Well, you could just put it in the oven, but I think it comes out so much better mm -hmm. if you let it come to room temperature before you roast it. Because it doesn't have to fight, mm -hmm. the oven doesn't have to fight the coldness. Yeah, exactly, it's not like shocked. Right. So you, I like to let it sit for like three hours. Okay. But then the great news is, because it's spatchcocked and dry brined, we're gonna cook it on high heat, 425, and it only takes like 90 minutes. What? Yeah. Game changer. I know, instead of having your oven blocked up with a turkey for like four hours, you can have time to make your casseroles and your pies and all that, and this just goes in right before you eat. Crazy. I just changed the game. You have. <laughs> Mind blown. All right, uh -huh, so uh -huh. this is in there, and, and while this is in there. Well, before it goes in oh, there. Oh, before it goes in there. One more step. One, one more, more thing. Step. So we want to brush it with a little bit of fat to help get that uh, crispy, crispy skin. Gotcha. I like to use key, which is butter that has had the milk solid. The clarified milk. butter. Clarified butter, okay. yeah. So it's gonna it's gonna give us all the flavor of butter, but mm -hmm. it has a higher smoke point, so it's gonna get really crispy as if we were using oil. Wow. All right. Magic. In the oven. In the oven. 425. 90 minutes. 90 minutes. While that's happening, we've got more stuff happening here. Yes. Well, okay, so gravy. Gravy. A lot of people make the gravy with the drippings. Yes. But I actually don't because there's a lot of people around the house. There's right. so many things happening. Mm -hmm. Gravy is an easy thing to get done like a couple days before. Do it ahead of time. Get it out of the way. Knock way. it out. Knock it out. And then the drippings, I like to save as a special treat for the next day. Listen to this. You take those drippings. Mm -hmm. You're gonna take your leftover turkey, fry them in the drippings, wow. and make turkey carnitas tacos. Oh my gosh. Right? Where have you been all my life? <laughs> so the gravy you're gonna make a few days before. Okay. Uh, if you wanna be extra, take that backbone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you just, you're not oh, you didn't mean take it. Not right now. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I thought you should take that backbone. I'm a very literal person. So yeah. Well, I'm well, sorry. Well, what you can do is take that backbone, uh -huh. roast it up in some fat, uh -huh. maybe roast up your giblets, mm -hmm. and then cook that with some broth and a bunch of veggies to make it really, really flavorful, which okay. is what we've done already. Right. So this is a broth that's like amped up. It's like turned up. We've got, it's like got- broth on steroids. Boom, exactly, yeah. yeah. It's like broroids. Exactly. Yeah, so then once we have your broth, we're gonna make our gravy. Gravy keeps. Nothing bad is going to happen to this if you make it a few days early, so just really? go for it. Okay. 
So you got some butter in here. Starting with some butter. Okay. We're gonna make a really simple roux to mm. thicken up our gravy. So we're gonna melt our butter until it's nice and foamy, and then I'm gonna add some flour. You wanna wait until it gets foamy, because okay. then the butter is hot enough to like, you know, evenly absorb the flour and you don't have any lumps. That's why you end up with lumps. If you just dump the flour in right ah. now, the lump, if you make lumps early, yes. you're gonna have lumps the whole time. Lumps, lumps are forever. Lumps are forever, okay. so you just make sure you don't start with any lumps. No. Okay, so we got foamage, so now my flour foamage. is getting in. We had foamage. And we just want this to get like, it's gonna get foamy again mm -hmm. and blonde. You don't wanna, you don't wanna overcook the roux at this point, cause, but this is really it. That's all. That's, that's, it? As, that's as far as you need to take okay. it. And now we're gonna add our broth a splash at a time. Now, okay, you know Jacques Pepin, the legendary yes. chef? He can add the broth all at once and not end up with lumpy gravy. But I'm not Jacques Pepin, you're That's not right. Jacques Pepin. No, 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 nobody is Jacques No one Pepin. listening Except is Jacques, Jacques Pepin. Pepin. No, I think you should add it a tablespoon at a time and just make sure you're lump free. It's almost like you're, you're making a gravy risotto. Uh-huh. And then once you add all of this liquid, you need to make sure it simmers for a few minutes to lose that raw, flowery taste. Otherwise, you can like, you can taste it. You're like, ooh. You know? Yeah. It's gonna be a little weird and starchy. Now, th everything here has been pretty simple. We yes. just got like salt, herbs, but you can like get crazy here if you want. You could add some, I don't know, chipotle peppers. Mm -hmm. Get make a spicy gravy to Ooh. go with your southwestern barbecue turkey. Very nice. You know, I just like, I want to give you a basic like outline so people can get home. And, and now we're gonna season it up. I'm gonna keep it really simple, a little bit of time. Okay a little black pepper. We're gonna add salt to taste. Now, um, a lot of, if you're using like a store-bought broth, it probably has a good bit of salt. So make sure you mm -hmm. taste it before you get crazy because it might the, be good. The fat, the butter you use, would you use salted or unsalted? I always use unsalted because okay. okay. I want full control. Okay. You know? So you can always add salt, but once the salt's in there. It's over. You're done. Game over, yeah. Forget it. Okay, and then I like a touch wow. honey. of honey. I, I was referring to that, not you. Uh, but uh, <laughs> that's, Crazy. Well, I think that I love a little bit of sweetness uh -huh. on the Thanksgiving table because I grew up with the cranberry sauce from the can. Yeah, who didn't? Yeah, so this kind of gives me that sweetness in a different way. Mm. And also, so when I'm sad, the my sad food, my husband makes this for me, is mashed potatoes with this honey gravy. So now it's like my favorite thing. Oh my gosh. He's a and lovely it's so man. sweet that you have a husband who makes you uh, food to lift you out of your sadness. Yeah, I'm, I'm lucky. Okay, so then make this in advance. Uh -huh. um, so the giblets, my mom always used the giblets, always, either in the stuffing or the gravy. So what I did was, the day you get your turkey all dry brined, sear them off that day while they're nice and fresh. A uh. little bit of salt mm -hmm. in a little bit of butter, um, nicely chopped up, and then you, on the day of Thanksgiving, you can either add it to your gravy, which is what I'm gonna do, or you can um, add it to your stuffing, that's also really tasty. Oh, that's interesting. But if you don't like giblets, don't eat them. No. But at least give them to the dogs. The dog likes the giblets. Dog loves the well, giblets, you know? I love the giblets. I do too. Hey, I'm Hallie. It's good to be with you tonight. There's another legal filing today, and I want to cut through some of the weedsy stuff. And let's just, like, get to the point. They have started to vote on the PACT Act. If you're like, Hallie, stop speaking Washingtonese. This bill would basically give health care to veterans who have exposed to these toxic chemicals. So Scott, I'm trying to make this as not D.C. as possible. The increased sort of anger that we've seen now in politics. I saw you searching for, I think, your microphone, Dan. Yeah. You are out. I was trying got to it. do it on the slide. Live TV, man. It's okay. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight and expert analysis. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. Hey, podcast fans. Ready to unlock our true crime mysteries? Try Dateline Premium on Apple Podcasts. You'll get early access to originals, plus bonus content. And everything is ad-free. So head to Apple Podcasts now to subscribe. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Hey, podcast fans, ready to unlock our true crime mysteries? Try Dateline Premium on Apple Podcasts. You'll get early access to originals, plus bonus content, and everything is ad-free. So head to Apple Podcasts now to subscribe. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Over here is our... Uh... Our lovely finished bird? Yes, yeah, so after your bird comes out of the oven, uh -huh. you gotta let it rest. Right, how long? At least 
at least 20 minutes un uncovered because mm -hmm. if you cover it it's going to get steamy and you're going to lose that crispy skin uh, but it's okay for like 40 minutes if you have other things you need to do mm -hmm. and like while while it waits i think we can like get dressed up you know oh prepare right we can dress up just like the turkey the turkey doesn't have to have all of the fun yeah there you go <laughs> yeah by spatchcocking it, mm -hmm. is it easier to carve? Because so a lot, much of, easier. a lot of people have, including myself, have butchered a good turkey. That makes it so hard. It's easier to just remove the whole breast and then work with the pieces on your cutting board. So you're gonna take, when your turkey is like out of the oven, mm -hmm. take it to your guests, let them revel in the glory. Behold. Behold. We have spatchcocked this for you. Yeah. And then bring it back into the kitchen and we're gonna carve. Mm -hmm. Now carving's not so hard. Just start with the pieces that are the most in the way. I'm gonna get rid of these wings. We're not actually cutting through any bones, so the turkey is so nice and tender. We're just really easily, yeah. see it's like butter. Just like that. We're just coming right through the joints. So the leg immediately just beautifully came off, right? That's amazing. Just make the turkey work for you. You don't even have to like know what you're doing here. You can just rip off the pieces. Look at this. Bone. And then we just work our way along this breastbone to remove the meat right off the breast. You can see these ribs right here. Mm -hmm. Just move along the ribs and just slice them right off. Easy peasy, anyone can do this. Okay, so now we have this beautiful boneless breast. Mm -hmm. Instead of trying to do this crazy carve with it right. on, we just go across just and we get like it's a Like it's a, a, like a, a, a loin. Exactly, and now everyone gets a little bit of skin. That's why I love cutting the turkey this way. Yeah. Everybody gets some crispy skin. The meat is so tender and juicy. I wish they could just breed a turkey that's just made of skin. We're probably going to get there soon. Yeah. They'll probably figure out how to make it plant-based. Just a plant-based uh, skin. Wow. The mind boggles. Yeah. Okay, Look so at that. got a couple of nice slices. Ugh. Boom. That looks nice, that right? That's fantastic. That's like, that's like sandwich ready. Yeah, it is. And which is the best part? The next day sandwich? Yeah. I like that more than the actual meal. I do too. You want a little dark meat? Of course. So I like to debone the dark meat too. So that, you know, it's not just going to that one person who gets the leg first. Right. I'm gonna flip this over and the bone is right here. We're gonna run our knife right, right along the bone. Mm -hmm. And you just just gently like peel that skin right off the bone. The meat is really tender, so once we get around here, it'll just slip right out. Flip it over. Wait, keep the skin intact. This is the most important. Ah. Shh. No one's watching, right? No, no, they're just listening. They're just listening. All right, and I'm getting, so you can see I've, I've pulled the bone out of here. Mm -hmm. And now we just lose it. Boom. Bang. Boom, and then we can flip this over and get really nice, thick slices of dark meat as well. See, I've never seen the dark meat sliced. Why the hell not? Make it easier for your guests, you know? Yeah, it's all about the guests. I usually just slice up half the turkey, mm -hmm. one leg, one breast, right. and then um, try to save the rest for myself for later. God. You know what I mean? That's the trick. Okay, we got nice thick slices of dark meat. All right, do you have a preference, dark or light? I'm, I'm more of the dark meat, but, Me but, but I will say this, this uh, breast meat. Not bad. It's pretty spectacular. Yeah, I think so too. It's that MSG. Don't be scared, guys. Okay, a little gravy. Mm -hmm. And we are ready for to dine. Little giblets. That looks pretty Look good. That. Yeah, right? You can make this. Anyone can make this. And, and I think that it's great because you can get as creative as you want with the flavors. Just think about this as a technique demonstration. This is doing weird things to my hair. <laughs> go in for the dark meat. That's what I'm doing. That's my move. That's my favorite bit. That's your jam. That's my jam. A little bit of skin, a little bit of giblet. Whoa. Grab your apron for a new podcast, Cooking Up a Storm with Al Roker. My forecast, yummy. Some of the best chefs spill the beans on family secrets to get you ready for Thanksgiving. Then fun, bringing the heat for the holidays. Listen now, wherever you get your podcasts.
Welcome to Cooking Up a Storm. I'm Al Roker. Today, we have reached the sixth and final episode of our Thanksgiving series, which means we've saved the sweetest for last. I mean, literally. Today, we are talking Thanksgiving dessert, but not just any dessert, the star of desserts. I'm talking pie. And one woman in particular, she is an expert at parsing which flavors to pair with which to bring new and inventive pies to our table. Her name is Maya Camille Broussard, and she partially attributes her unique palate to an acute sense of both taste and smell, a byproduct of her being hard of hearing. So, who better to ask about the best pies to bring to folks' table than this talented chef? You probably remember her from her time on the Netflix reality show, Bake Squad, where she was known as a flavor fanatic, and where she made some incredible creations, including an entire edible house. Maya Camille joining me now today with an exciting new recipe that offers a thrilling twist on a classic Thanksgiving treat, sweet potato and plantain pie. Maya Camille, welcome to Cooking Up a Storm. How are you? I'm good. Uh, I'm better now that I'm here oh, with you. Well, thank you. So tell me about this pie, the, mm-hmm. the sweet potato plantain. How did you come up with this? So let's talk about sweet potato first. Okay. Because we, you know, historically we have to talk about the origins of that. Mm-hmm. Sweet potato is pretty much indigenous to the Americas, North America. But when um, enslaved Africans were brought over here, they were used to yams in Africa. And so sweet potatoes is sort of closely related to the yam. It's the next best thing that we have. So most sweet potato dishes are savory, whether it's sweet potato french fries mm-hmm. or most just sweet potatoes. And in the 18th century, the sweet potato itself was prepared in a custard style the way that they did in England, and it was savory. Similar to how you have a carrot souffle in mm-hmm. New Orleans, a sweet potato was made in a casserole dish. It wasn't until the 19th century that it became a dessert in the South, of course, mm-hmm. you know, where a lot of the culinary ingenuity resides. It is a child of the South, and it is a child of the uh, Black community. When I thought about what I wanted to do, if I were to do anything to remix this already timeless dessert that, you know, people feel some kind of way about this sweet potato pie. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> you, you, you could start a fight about that. We're going to fight about it, and we're going to argue about which is better, that or a pumpkin. Yeah, it's not a fight. I know. The sweet potato. <laughs> Why even bother with pumpkin? <laughs> I, why? I don't understand. Why? When you, you have know, sweet potato yeah, right in front uh, of you. Maybe because people had leftover pumpkin from jack-o'-lanterns at Halloween, <laughs> and they just felt, you know, we've got to do something with this. <laughs> Who knows? I but know. you know what? I'll keep my sweet potato. But I had dinner one night in Barbados, and the chef made mashed sweet potatoes, but it had plantains in it, uh-huh. or plantains, as you like to say. But, you know, immediately I thought, okay, how can I make this work in a pie? You know, from a technique standpoint, it, it is a lot of steps. Mm-hmm. Um, you have to roast your sweet potato. You have to fry your plantains. It's not simply throwing ingredients together in a bowl. And I didn't know if it was going to work because plantains are starchier than sweet potatoes. It's multiple steps. That's time consuming. It's not hard to do. It's just it takes time. It mm-hmm. requires patience. But it's like I life. Wanted- it, like life. <laughs> so, growing up, what kind of pies did you like at, oh, thanks- sweet potatoes, at Thanksgiving? For sure. Sweet for potatoes. Sure. Yeah, I'm from Chicago. And so, a lot of families, black families from Chicago, are migrated, uh, products of the Great Migration from mm-hmm. the South. So, our, our food is very Southern, dare I say, soulful. <laughs> but it's uh, definitely foods that we grew up on. My mother grew up on even more Southern foods than, like, she's rutabaga. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's hardcore. Yeah, that's very old school. <laughs> I don't eat that. <laughs> She'd be like, oh, I want some rutabaga for Thanksgiving. I'm like, Mom, <laughs> Yeah. who are you? You talk about the fact that because you have a difficulty with one sense, your hearing, that it has heightened your sense of taste and your t- sense of smell. Mm-hmm. How has that influenced you as a baker? I don't want to say I have a perfect palate, but I can smell and taste things that, and pick up on things that other people may not be able to, or at least do it sooner. I'm that way with taste. I'm like, what is that? You know, I taste this, I taste that. 
But did you know that women make better tasters, like even as sommeliers, and men make better noses when it comes to um, perfumes? Ooh. So I think that also being a woman helps. <laughs> we did a profile with you on the third hour of today, mm -hmm. and we talked about your dad and and how he influenced you. Tell, tell us a little bit about that. My dad was obsessed with pies. This man would wake up on Saturday morning and put on an apron, and the apron said, skinny people make bad cuts. <laughs> and he would actually wear a toque. Wow. A toque. A little chef's hat. <laughs> yes. In the kitchen. I'm looking at him like, dude, you are not a professional chef. Like, why are you wearing a toque? <laughs> But he took it so seriously, and he was obsessed with pies and quiches and anything made in the crust, tarts, you know, literally. Any, I mean, the man was obsessed with food, not to lie, like, lie about it, but he really had a special place in his heart for pie. And so he would wake up, make a quiche or a pie, and then call somebody and brag about it. <laughs> <laughs> it even influenced the name of your company, mm -hmm. Justice of the Pies. Mm -hmm. where, where did that come from? I was trying to think of something that... Um, could be a nice play on the fact that he was a criminal defense attorney. My dad nicknamed himself the Pie Master, so my aunt wanted me to call the company the Pie Master's Daughter. And I was like, nah, <laughs> you know, let's be a little bit more creative. What about justice of the pies? And my cousin was like, you know, I like that. That's mm -hmm. different. And as with I do with most things in my life, I knew I wanted to be purposeful. The Justice of the Pies is L3C. We are a social mission-based company. Our goal is to positively impact the lives of others. So while I typically tend to focus on fighting food insecurities, that could mean being in the front line. Mm -hmm. you, know, that's, you know, there are many different ways in which I show up. When you get invited to, say, a, a, a celebration like Thanksgiving, mm -hmm. is it because people love you and want you there, or is it because they want your pie? If they want my pie, then I have to buy it. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, usually um, I'm going to tell you something that is kind of sad. Typically on Thanksgiving Day in the past six years, I, I'm in bed. I'm exhausted. Wow. I've stayed up for 48 hours the night before. My mom would make me a plate and tell me to come downstairs and get it. I get it. I eat, and then I eat myself to sleep. I put myself in a food Because you've been baking because I've been right baking. up to... I, well, I guess I would think Thanksgiving must be like your Super Bowl. Yeah. But you know what I love about Thanksgiving, though? Be, even if I'm not able to eat everything I want on the day of, oh, I have leftovers for a whole week. That's the best part. Like, take leftover turkey and then make a turkey salad, almost like a chicken salad with uh -huh. some dry cranberries in it. Mm. And dressing. Make a sandwich. Layer it with some dressing some turkey salad, mm -hmm. and then have a slice of pie. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. You get one beautiful life to live. What are you going to do? This show is so fun, but having you as a positive force means really the world. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold, okay? We have this circle of women that love each other. I decided I'm going to go with the rhythm of life. And you love riding the I way. love riding. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. I love you. I love you too. <laughs> Hey, podcast fans, ready to unlock our true crime mysteries? Try Dateline Premium on Apple Podcasts. You'll get early access to originals, plus bonus content, and everything is ad-free. So head to Apple Podcasts now to subscribe. The day's biggest political stories, with trusted insight and expert analysis. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. We saved the best for last because dessert is the best part. So how do we prep the sweet potato? First thing first is preheat your oven to 400 degrees. We want to bake about one pound of sweet potato. So it could take about an hour and a half to two really? hours, yes. So now I'm scooping out 
the flesh. Let me tell you something. Okay. The very important thing when you make a sweet potato pie yes. is you gotta get the little fiber strings off. Oh. So you see these fibers? Uh-huh. When we mash it, and the fibers tend to naturally stick to whatever instrument you're using. Oh. Here's a fiber right here. You know why this is so important? Why? Because I don't need somebody Southern grandma complaining to me about strings in a oh. sweet potato pie. You yeah, know, I see there's, there's a couple on the No on the meatball, there's no strings in my sweet potato pie. <laughs> <laughs> so now that's one half component okay. of our pie. We're gonna move over to our plantain or plantain. <laughs> and may, many people think, oh, it's a banana. It's a banana, it's a cousin of the banana. Ah. But when you eat this green, it's extremely starchy. When, they, uh, when people make tostones, they may use a green plantain, but we're making plantains or plantains, and so we want it to look black with yellow spots. Mm -hmm. We want it to be very ripe. And one way to ensure that you can speed up the ripening process is to throw a couple of these in a plastic bag that you would get from the grocery store mm -hmm. and tie it up. Oh, okay. And that helps to speed it up. But we've got a heavy bottom pot filled with Oreo mm -hmm. and uh, vegetable Oreo. You want a non-flavored Oreo. Something kind of neutral. Yeah. Uh -huh. So we put this on medium high heat, which mm -hmm. is about 380 degrees. Right. Now we're going to take our plantain and we're going to use a chef's knife or you could use a regular butter knife. Mm -hmm. You know, whatever you have in your home, we're going to trim off the edges. When I'm trimming it off, I'm trimming it off in a crosswise position. So that means slightly at an angle. Okay. And then I'm going to slice down the center of the plantain. Carefully. Carefully. <laughs> <laughs> and actually I'm going to peel away half of it. It's funny, it really does look like a banana. It does. Like I said, it's a cousin of it, but this is not something that you could eat raw. Mm -hmm. It is something that you have, you to, have cook. to cook. Yes. Some people use this for flour even. Uh, this is a really cool, I, I'm not gonna say vegetable, fruit. The reason why I almost said vegetable is because a lot of people eat this savory. Mm -hmm. They may um, put some like chili slices on this garlic, sure. but um, we're eating it in a sweet form. So we're going to slice this crosswise. Uh -huh. And I leave the skin on the bottom so it doesn't stick to the bottom of my cutting board mm -hmm. because it is starchy. Oh, that's a chef tip. Mm -hmm. So now we're going to drop this in the pot of oil. I'm gonna take off the bottom skin. So let's drop that in okay. carefully. Nice sizzle. Yes. Mm, yes. That's how you know your um, Oreo is hot. You can also test your Oreo by putting a sprinkle of flour in there, uh -huh. and if it starts to kind of bubble up the way it is now, that's how you know your Oreo is hot. And I notice it's it's floating up to the mm -hmm. top once it starts really getting fried. And that's because I have enough oil in there. So people ask, well, how much oil should I put in there? And it's kind of hard to give an exact answer because I don't know the size of your vessel. But it should definitely be a, more than two inches, mm -hmm. you know, three to four inches maybe, because you do want your slices to float. So when we're making this pie, I tend to use um, maybe two or three plantains. Sometimes I do four because I like to snack on some. <laughs> after I'm frying it. So we're gonna let this fry right. for three to four minutes until it's nice golden brown. What What is it about why, I myself don't trust anybody who doesn't like pie. <laughs> what is it about pie that seems to be that common denominator, everybody loves pie? It's nostalgic. I think that uh, people start out with apple pie. It's something that's not trendy. It's here to stay. It's not going anywhere. It's not a hybrid of like a donut and a croissant. <laughs> you know, which is cool, yeah. but we don't know what the lifespan of that is going to be, where the lifespan of a pie is forever and ever, amen. I mean, there have been variations like the hand pie, mm -hmm. things like that, but, but we, we like pie. Mm -hmm. Pie and anything encased in the crust, is a food of the people. Maya, is it a cheat? Because to me, the toughest part about the pie is the crust. Is it okay to like buy a pre-made crust and you know bake that up and then put your own filling in? 
Look, if you won't tell, I won't tell. <laughs> <laughs> of course it's okay. I mean, it's completely understandable. Sometimes you you need a shortcut because you want to focus all of your energy on the filling. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I use a pre-made uh, puff pastry. So I'm using a mesh strainer, mm -hmm. right, to take my plantain out of the Oreo, but you can also use a slotted spoon. Mm -hmm. Just as long, as long as we have something with holes in it that allows us to Drain shake off, off the oil. excess oil. And then I'm going to put the plantains onto a plate that is lined with paper towel. Is that to absorb the extra oil? All of that extra oil. So here's another key. We have our sweet potato puree. Mm -hmm. This has to be chilled. This needs to be cooled. But this, because it's starchier, needs to be warm. So what we're going to do is we're going to take our plantains that we just pulled from the oil. We're going to place that into our bowl with these sweet potatoes that's already pureed. Mm -hmm. Ooh. A little toasty? It's hot. <laughs> I kind of want to save this one, you know, to, like for, I told you. I snacking? like to snack on it. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, I, there you go. That's your, that's your reward. Today is now a podcast. Available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. You'll get one beautiful life to live. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold. We have this circle of women that love each other. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Love you. I love you too. Today is now a podcast. Available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Hey, I'm Hallie. It's good to be with you tonight. There's another legal filing today, and I want to cut through some of the weedsy stuff. And let's just, like, get to the point. They have started to vote on the PACT. If you're like, Kelly, stop speaking Washingtonese. This bill would basically give health care to veterans who have exposed to these toxic chemicals. So Scott, I'm trying to make this as not D.C. as possible. The increased sort of anger that we've seen now in politics. I saw you searching for, I think, your microphone, Dan. Yeah. You are, oh, I was you trying to do it on the slide. Live TV, man. It's okay. You get one beautiful okay. life to live. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold. We have this circle of women that love each other. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Love you. I love you too. <laughs> For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. You get one beautiful life to live. What are you going to do? This show is so fun, but having you as a positive force means really the world. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold, okay? We have this circle of women that love each other. I decided I'm gonna go with the rhythm of life. And you love riding the I wave. Love the ride. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Love you. I love you too. <laughs> Okay, so I use either, um, if you don't have these tools, you can use a mash, a potato masher mm -hmm. like we used before. But to get it really, really smooth, we need an immersion blender. Oh. We are going to take that. What's happening is the sweet potatoes that's chilled is cooling our plantains as we blend it. Mm -hmm. Also, this is the perfect time to reduce the heat in your oven to oh. 350 degrees. Okay. Okay. You gotta put you to work. <laughs> so when we started mashing right. the uh, sweet potatoes, it's a bright orange color. Mm -hmm. But now that we've added the plantains, we see that the color is now yellow orange. Yeah. Yeah. So now that that's mashed, we can move on to our filling. So we have our mixer, our mixing bowl right. with a paddle attachment. Okay. Mmm. <laughs> you haven't mastered the, the art of talking and eating. See, on the Today Show, I'm constantly eating, so I know how to talk and eat. But that's... So, so you take a smaller bite, see, because you took the bigger I bite. Know. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I was trying to be cute with it, but... <laughs> so, we have our mixer mm -hmm. with a paddle attachment, and we have um, the butter right. and brown sugar. Light brown sugar. Remember, when you uh, measure it, make sure it's packed so that you have the correct measurement. 
also, your butter needs to be at room temperature. It needs to be softened because we're going to cream the butter and mm -hmm. the sugar together. So let's turn that on. Mm -hmm. You gotta mm -hmm. maybe push down mm -hmm. the on. So whenever you're mixing something in the mixing bowl mm -hmm. with the paddle attachment, you have to make sure that you always scrape down the sides and mm -hmm. the bottom of the bowl to make sure that your ingredients are well incorporated. Nice, creamy. So we're gonna whip this for three minutes until okay. it's a nice, creamy, fluffy mixture. <laughs> right. Ooh, that's a good evil laugh. I like that. You could be a super villain. A super villain who bakes. I like that. That's very good. So now we need a binder. Okay. What's gonna bind our pie custard together? Eggs. All right. So we need to crack in two whole large eggs. While it's while it's being beaten. Um, no, you can put oh. the egg in first. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful egg. Yeah, there's a lovely. Okay. So let's go ahead and beat that. You want to blend that until it is well combined. You see how your sugar mm -hmm. and butter is sticking to the side? So that's when you need to turn it off. Oh, you're gonna scare me. Okay, turn it off. Now scrape down the side and the bottom. And then we're going to turn it back on to make sure that the eggs are completely combined with the butter. You know, eggs and butter are like oil and water. So oh. you have to mix it really well to make sure that you create an emulsion. This is not a cake, so we don't necessarily need to make sure it rises or anything, uh -huh. but you know how when you're making cakes, you have to add an egg at a time? Right. That's not the case with this, because it's more dense. But we do want it to be nice and fluffy. Oh, that, look at that. And see, your brown sugar is now getting lighter. The yes. whole mixture is now getting lighter. It looks lighter. more chiffon-y. Yes. <laughs> Ooh, that's beautiful. All right, so All right. now we have to add some flavor. Okay, flavor. flavor. So we've got cinnamon, nutmeg, so that's a half a teaspoon of cinnamon, mm -hmm. a half teaspoon of nutmeg, some salt, salt, kosher salt. The reason why I use kosher salt is because the crystal is bigger, uh -huh. and so it's going to incorporate more easily with your um, filling. Also, table salt has sort of like a metallic Which taste to it. Because it's iodized. Yes. Mm -hmm. And now we have vanilla. Always a nice, healthy amount of that. This is two teaspoons. Let's mm -hmm. mix that together. Yeah, there you go. Scrape down the sides and the bottom of the bowl. Because you see the vanilla is mm -hmm. kind of Up on hanging out on the sides of the bowl yeah. here to go inside. Can't hang down on the bowl, buddy. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. I love this color. Perfect. So now we have our mashed mm -hmm. sweet potatoes and mashed plantain. Oh wait, I'm sorry, before that. <laughs> evaporated milk. Oh, evaporated milk. Let's pour that in while it's mixing. Perfect. So now we are going to turn this off. Okay. Now add the sweet potato and plantain puree. Beautiful orange, yellow, blend of a vegetable and a fruit. Every last bit. Can't waste it. Not after all that hard work we've been in. Mashing it. Perfect. So now that we've got the puree, the pureed mashed potatoes in there, let's go ahead and rip it back up. Do you see how it's like little white specks? Uh -huh. That's good. That lets us know that our filling has cooled down enough and the milk is still curdled. If your filling, your puree um, vegetables are too hot, it's going to melt that. You're not uh -huh. going to get a nice caramelization on top of your pie. So this is what gives, when you bake it, that crackly mm -hmm. top? Mm -hmm. Ah. Mm -hmm. Only sweet potato has that. Pumpkin doesn't have that, which is why I'm team sweet potato. Team yeah. sweet potato. <laughs> All right, so now we can turn it off. Okay. And we have a pie plate right. that is lined with an all butter pie crust. But okay. if you go to the store and get a crust, that's perfectly that's fine, fine too. Now, do we bake this first or do we put oh, the no. filling in? We put the filling, filling in first. Filling in first. There is no need to pre bake it. That's okay. a great question. All right, so here you are. Okay. 
Now I'm just gonna take my silicone spatula and just simply pour it right into the pie shell. This is an open face pie, so that means it only has a bottom crust. Mm -hmm. There is no top crust. Liquid so gold. So now I can spread it out mm -hmm. with the silicone spatula so that it's even. People say you should bake a pie in a glass pie plate mm -hmm. <laughs> because you can see the crust as it's baking, but also it's supposed to be more even. I use um, aluminum pie plates, but I also love the idea of a nice cast thick iron. Uh, cast iron. Cast iron. Beautiful. Yes. So now that we've reduced the heat in our oven, we're going to mm -hmm. take this, put it in our oven. Okay. Ta -da. And Ta -da. How, long, how long will it be in there? Uh, 45 minutes, you know. Unfortunately. Look, it depends on the attitude of your oven. Oven have temperament. The attitude of your oven. Yes. Ooh. Look at how beautiful that is. That is gorgeous. The With texture the of that. That crust is perfectly golden brown. You did the perfect thing. You're cutting the pie slice with the tip of your knife. That gives us a cleaner slice. Ah. Ah, look well, at you. Well, from, from many years of, of trial and error, mm -hmm. I've kind of discovered this. Yeah. The first slice is always the yes. hardest. Yes. My, oh, my. Uh, wow, look at that. Ooh. Gotta give, gotta give me a slice, too. Ooh. Bon appetit. Wow. Mm. That's the smoothest, like, sweet potato mm. pie. It does, is, is it the plantain that, that helps it with that consistency? No, remember I said, blend those sweet potatoes so me ma will complain you, about you greens did. in you your pie? You did say that. You, you got to blend that. it right. Do you taste a slight layer in the flavor profile of the plantain? Mm -hmm. So it doesn't, sometimes when you create something new, it doesn't have to be extremely different. No. It's just a small nuance that changes how you eat a pie. Mm. And it makes me smile. You get one beautiful life to live. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold. We have this circle of women that love each other. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Love you. Love you too. This is a critical choke point for this fire. And good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. You get one beautiful life to live. What are you gonna do? This show is so fun, but having you as a positive force means really the world. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold, okay? We have this circle of women that love each other. I decided I'm gonna go with the rhythm of life. And you love riding the I way. love riding. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Love you. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, podcast fans, ready to unlock our true crime mysteries? Try Dateline Premium on Apple Podcasts. You'll get early access to originals, plus bonus content, and everything is ad-free. So head to Apple Podcasts now to subscribe. Maya Camille, what are you thankful for this Thanksgiving? Well, I'm thankful for a lot of things. You know, I wake up and I have a gratitude journal and I write down 10 things on most days. <laughs> you know, 10 things that I'm thankful for. But I think that I am most thankful uh, for abundance. I have an abundance of people who support me. I have an abundance of love from those who truly know me and who are rooting for me. I have an abundance. I mean, I have a queen size bed that I sleep in. I have gas in my car. I have full fridge all the time. I'm, I'm never lacking in food. You know, I'm really am grateful for just being able to be comfortable in life because I know it's not lost on me that everyone doesn't live the way that I live. Well, we support everything you're doing with these pies. They are fantastic. Maya Camille Broussard, thank you so much no, for being... No, thank you. Oh, no, thank you. <laughs> and especially for the sweet potato plantain uh, pie. Yeah. Thank you. I think I'm going to have a bite. What That's about right. you? 
And thank you for joining us today for the final edition of Cooking Up a Storm. I'm Al Roker. Happy Thanksgiving. Grab your apron for a new podcast, Cooking Up a Storm with Al Roker. I forecast yummy. Some of the best chefs spill the beans on family secrets to get you ready for Thanksgiving. This is fun. Bringing the heat for the holidays. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts. The hills are alive with the sights and smells and tastes. Ah, come on. It's a food show. Now, nothing says autumn quite like apple. Whether it's a trip to an orchard like this, a warm slice of apple pie, or cheering with cider. But when did apples become the apple of America's eye? I left the Big Apple, and I'm here in Massachusetts, where America's history with apples actually began. So today, we are going to get to the core of how apples became a homegrown hero. How do you like them apples? Time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're going to learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. My family and I have been coming here to Hilltop Orchards in Massachusetts for the past 20 years. That's right. In fact, you'd be hard-pressed to find a better fall family activity than apple picking, and especially the apple cider donuts. And of course, what also pairs well with a trip to orchards? Cider. And they make a lot of it here at Hilltop. Oh, and did I mention the donuts? Meet David and Sarah Martell, high school sweethearts who reconnected in their 30s. Together, they run Hilltop Orchards. We're definitely an apple orchard, but we're also a winery and a cidery, so we're a triple threat. Today, David handles the operations of the orchard, cidery, and winery, with Sarah focusing on guest experience. The orchard's historic cider mill, where David played as a kid, was renovated in 1997. Now, they call it home. I started coming to this orchard when I was about six years old. My father worked here then. David left the Berkshires and worked in construction for several years. When he decided to return home, he really went back to his roots, taking a part-time job at Hilltop. I've been in the orchard business for about 12 years now. David's the third generation in his family to work on the 100-something-year-old orchard. Did you ever think that you would be running the orchard someday? Nah, in a million years. I quickly fell in love with these apple trees and decided that's what I'm going to do. Diving in and learning about all the different apples and the history of apples. And that history is pretty sweet. I like to think of myself as an apple nerd. <laughs> My name is Amy Traverso, and I'm the senior food editor at Yankee Magazine and the author of the Apple Lover's Cookbook. Crab apples are the only variety indigenous to North America. Sweet apples were introduced to America by early colonists in the 1600s. Sweet apples have their origins in this area of Western China, sort of the border between Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan, called the Tian Shan Mountain Range. Those apple seeds came over with the Jamestown Expedition, and trees were planted at Plymouth. But in the early days, colonists weren't making pies and tarts. Most apples grown in America at that time were more likely to be turned into cider than eaten. Apples played a very important role when there was people coming from England. As they say on the boat, they would make hard cider because that cider would last where water might spoil and someone would get sick. This trend continued stateside. By 1775, 10% of all New England farms had a cider mill. Today, I am at B.F. Clyde Cider Mill in Old Mystic, Connecticut. Meet Amy Harrison and her daughter, Sarah Monk, fifth and sixth generation owners of Clyde's. We're the last original steam-powered cider mill in the United States. Back in, you know, the 1800s, early 1900s, everybody had a cider mill that had a farm. We use the same press, it's the same mill, and not many people get to go to work and put their hands on a lever and say, you know what, my great-great-grandfather did this same thing back in 
1898. Cider was really important to early America because it was relatively easy to make. People had apples in abundance. And Thomas Jefferson and John Adams famously loved it, drank it every day. Children drank it because it was low in alcohol, but it was often safer than water. Water could often be contaminated at that time. These days, Americans don't drink as much cider as the founding fathers. Two things happened to kind of bring the apple to its knees. We had immigration from Germany and Czechoslovakia, which were beer growing regions. Beer took over as the major American drink. Another reason behind cider's decline? Prohibition. Apples were very strongly associated with cider at the time. They were really seen as a source of alcohol. My great great grandmother was arrested twice, never convicted, but arrested twice for um, bootlegging. In the 1930s, Apple's sinful image was reborn as shipping methods improved. Sweet apples from Washington State could be transported all over the country, and the industry grew. Apples then had to be remarketed as just a dessert thing, as something you bake with or eat fresh from your hand. And so apples, they went through this rebranding and emerged as this sort of innocent, sweet fruit that wasn't going to get you drunk or do anything naughty. It was just going to make a nice pie. <laughs> Now, even hard cider is making a comeback, due in large part to the craft beer boom in the late aughts. Gluten's having a moment, so people are shying away from a lot of beers. Cider is fermented apples, and that's it. Where a lot of other beverages or mixed drinks or anything of that nature could have a lot of preservatives and different things added to them. Today, Americans are drinking 10 times more cider than a decade ago, and that's meant big business for Hilltop. Most of our guests are cider enthusiasts that are relatively new to the cider craze. Hilltop making around 1,500 gallons daily, and I got a chance to give it a try, or a press. They say time to make the donuts, it's time to make the cider. So here's some gloves, I see okay. you brought your boots. Yeah, I did. The process starts with freshly picked apples that are washed thoroughly. Next up, culling. As Benjamin Franklin once said, the rotten apple spoils his companion. They're sorting through what's coming down the conveyor. This apple has some dings and bumps. The good apples are sent to the grinding wheel. And they will get ground up to an applesauce consistency. Now it's my turn to prepare the ground apples for pressing. So it's like an apple sludge diaper. That's it. Then the apples get pressed down to the last drop. That's 2,000 pounds of pressure per square inch. Up until this point, the process for sweet and hard cider is the same. Excellent. And nobody got hurt. Sweet cider would be bottled at this stage. For hard cider, the fermentation process begins. So sweet cider becomes more popular once we can refrigerate apple juice to prevent it from fermenting. In the mid-20th century, cider stands and apple picking became an American pastime, a tradition my family's enjoyed for more than 20 years each fall. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. It's good to be with you tonight. There's another legal filing today, and I want to cut through some of the weedsy stuff. And let's just, like, get to the point. They have started to vote on the PACT Act. If you're like, Kelly, stop speaking Washingtonese. This bill would basically give health care to veterans who have exposed to these toxic chemicals. Scott, I'm trying to make this as not D.C. as possible. The increased sort of anger that we've seen now in politics. I saw you searching for, I think, your microphone, Dan. Yeah. You are I was you trying to do it on the slide. Live TV, man. It's okay. 
Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. There's just something about apple picking that inspires my best dad jokes. What apple sayings have you heard? There's a lot of um, insider sayings. <laughs> okay, I, I got one for you. Okay. okay. They say the family that plays together stays together. The family that picks together sticks together. There you go. As far as my kids are concerned, my jokes are as much a part of our annual tradition as the apples themselves. It's like, oh, dad. <laughs> <laughs> My family's been coming to Hilltop for more than 20 years, even before my two youngest were born. I don't know if it's something about the season when apples ripen and it's starting to get cooler and you're thinking about like comforts of home and coziness. People have very intense emotional connections with apples. Agritourism in the United States started becoming popular during the Industrial Revolution when city dwellers looked to nature for recreation. Labor shortages during and after World War II saw farmers calling for volunteers to help pick crops. By the 1960s, enterprising farmers recognized America's love for apples. In the fall, the you-pick tradition became a profitable pastime at orchards all across the country. Is there a right way or and a wrong way to pick an apple? Spoiler alert, there is a wrong way. The problem with twisting and pulling the apple is that if it is not ripe, you're going to also get next year's apple. Can you show me? I can. So this is an apple that I know is not ready to pick yet. OK. So if we were to lift up on this, uh -huh. if it was ripe, it would come free. Right. So it did not come free. OK. Right next to it is some Macintosh apples. OK. And if you go ahead and lift up on one at a kind of a, at an angle into the sky, it comes, it comes free. Like that. So that means that it's ripe, okay? And the other thing is, well, that's the worst thing you can do when oh. you're picking an apple. So we, we treat these like eggs and oh, we place them in place the bucket. Place them in the bucket. There's sometimes little brown spots on them. That's from fingers. Oh. So the worst thing that you can do to somebody with a farm stand or, or a fruit grower is grab their apples and start squeezing them. I do like the Honeycrisp. Honeycrisp yeah. it is. I was gala, but uh, okay. I've moved to the Honeycrisp. With an empty nest, I thought this year's Roker family trip was going to look pretty different. But then I heard from my boy at college. Nick was very adamant about, OK, are you going to come pick me up so I can go apple picking? Because I thought, this will be the first year we don't have anybody to apple pick with. Right. Much to my delight, the family that picks together does stick together. Hey, podcast fans, ready to unlock our true crime mysteries? Try Dateline Premium on Apple Podcasts. You'll get early access to originals, plus bonus content, and everything is ad-free. So head to Apple Podcasts now to subscribe. Hey, I'm Hallie. It's good to be with you tonight. There's another legal filing today, and I want to cut through some of the weedsy stuff. And let's just, like, get to the point. They have started to vote on the PACT. If you're like, Hallie, stop speaking Washingtonese. This bill would basically give health care to veterans who have exposed to these toxic chemicals. Just got, I'm trying to make this as not D.C. as possible. The increased sort of anger that we've seen now in politics. I saw you searching for, I think, your microphone, Dan. Yeah. You are, oh, I was you trying got it. to do it on the slide. Live TV, man. It's okay. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight and expert analysis. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. You get one beautiful so life to live. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold. We have this circle of women that love each other. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Love you. Love you too. <laughs> Hey, podcast fans, ready to unlock our true crime mysteries? Try Dateline Premium on Apple Podcasts. You'll get early access to originals, plus bonus content, and everything is ad-free. So head to Apple Podcasts now to subscribe. You get one beautiful life to live. What are you going to do? This show is so fun, but having you as a positive force means really the world. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold, okay? We have this circle of women that love each other. I decided I'm going to go with the rhythm of life. And you love riding the I way. love riding. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Oh, yeah. I love you, too. I only have pies for you. America.
American Pie is certainly an American icon. And in Southern California, one local family's pies have achieved all-American status. And this holiday season, they're gearing up to make over 50,000 of these each week. I love apple pie. I, every time I eat apple pie, I think, man, my mom just hit it out of the park. I'm Dave Smothers. I'm Tim Smothers, and our mother started the Julian Pie Company in 1986. From a young age, Liz Smothers developed a passion and a knack for baking. She often tells the story of standing on a milk crate next to her mom. I was probably four or five years old. I would crawl up on a box and take the little leftover pieces of dough and put them in a jar lid. I would put the little apple in my jar lid and cover it, and she would bake it in the oven just along with hers, and I would eat it. I would say that if I had not had that experience, I would never be in the pie business. In the early 80s, the Smothers family moved to Julian, California, a picturesque mountain town near San Diego. Funds were tight, so my mom uh, ended up taking odd jobs. When we moved here, I had to go to work. The only place that a job was available was in a bakery. And uh, I, I tell you, after I started working with pie making, that old love just came right back. That love was mutual. Liz's pies were in high demand at the local bakeries where she worked, quickly gaining a loyal following. She had built up a reputation. There were stories that they would go in and go, well, I want one of her pies, and point at my mom. A historic gold mining town, Julian thrives thanks to agriculture, namely its award-winning apples. Once we came out here to Julian, and uh, she saw the opportunity. She just never looked back. Wild horses couldn't have stopped me. I, honestly, I was not thinking of how much money can I make. I just was dying to make a, a good pie like my mother made. Two years after moving to Julian, Liz opened her own shop, the Julian Pie Company. She was 50 years old, proving it's never too late to embark on a dream. My mom baked 120 pies and she sold out the first day. It was a, it was a great grand opening. In this shop, there's an apple pie for everyone. It's the apple crunch with vanilla ice cream. It's not too sweet and it's really fresh. This is the most amazing pie I have ever had in my life. From cherry apple to apple rhubarb, today, Julian has 15 unique apple pie varieties in rotation. Thank you so much. The most popular seller is the Dutch apple. My mom's kind of joke was that that's the pie that pays our rent. Today, the busy bakers here make up to 10,000 pies a day. Pie production beginning around 3 a.m. It's no surprise that fall is their busiest season. Thanksgiving's the Super Bowl, and, uh, and Christmas is like uh, another Super Bowl. The pies are primarily made by hand, starting off with four ingredients. Pie crust is just flour, water, shortening, salt. That's it. It's the way you handle the dough, so you get a nice short bread crust rather than a chewy crust. The brothers say their mom had a gift for knowing just when to stop kneading to make it perfect. If you don't get the dough right, you might as well not have the business. Miguel's worked with my mom. He knows exactly the precise measurements of how to do things. We add a few hundred pounds of flour, very ice cold water. The twin arm mixer blends the dough. That's what I think of his grandma's hand. The 400 pound batch of dough heads to the extruder where it's cut into individual portions. So a 9.2 ounce puck falls into a pie shell, smashes the dough into a perfect shape, then they go into our freezers and we use them as needed. Next up, assembling the pies. Apples are peeled, sliced, then spiced. Cinnamon, sugar, and salt. This is all my mom's original recipe. There'll be a little bit of butter. Every time that dumps, I just get giddy. I'm like, yes, we hit it out of the park. So these pies have all been packed. They're nice and round, kind of like a mushroom. Patty's going to begin lifting, which is separating the, uh, the, the crust from the pie tin. If you don't do this step right here, that pie will bubble over in the oven. My mom was a queen fluter. The pies are brushed with an apple cider egg wash before baking. Then they're cooled, boxed, and ready to be shipped. Julian's pies are sold in hundreds of stores, including big grocery chains like Albertsons, as well as mom and pop shops throughout San Diego. My name's Sierra Smothers. I'm Liz Smothers' granddaughter. I grew up baking pies with my grandma. This job was actually my first job in high school. These days, Sierra pitches in wherever she's needed, including driving the delivery truck. I said, Sierra, do you want to spend the day with your dad and help me deliver pies? And she, of course, jumped at the opportunity. So we had a whole day together delivering pies. Everybody loved it.
Julian now has two locations, employing almost 70 people. So many admire their company's founder. It's the best spot. No, everything I do is very, how would Liz want it, want it done? Liz's perfectionism and attention to detail is really what's brought this company to the magnitude that it is. And if we don't carry that on, then what are we doing? <laughs> Liz passed away peacefully, surrounded by family in May. But her legacy lives on through the beloved recipes her family works hard to preserve. I just hope that she's looking down and whatever that we do, we, we have her in our hearts and uh, that she's proud. Oh, this is where you get choked up. <laughs> no, it's very, uh, it's very special. I really miss her. Um, she left a, a huge legacy with big shoes to fill. As for the future of Julian, the Smothers continue to welcome customers old and new with open arms. Come again, sweetie pie. That's my mom. Coming up next, a North Carolina family is giving candy apples a glow up with their colorful and creative creations. You get one beautiful life to live. What are you gonna do? This show is so fun, but having you as a positive force means really the world. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold, okay? We have this circle of women that love each other. I decided I'm gonna go with the rhythm of life. And you love riding the I way. Love the ride. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. I love yeah, I love you too. <laughs> this is a critical choke point for this fire. And good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight and expert analysis. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. How do you make apples even sweeter? Well, you dip them in candy, of course. Candy apples have long been associated with boardwalks and state fairs, but there's one entrepreneur in North Carolina who's taking this traditional treat to a whole new level with a colorful twist on the classic coating. My name is Kim Battle, and this is my husband, Travis Battle, and we are the owners of Candy, Candy Apples, Apples by K. K. Thank you. I would describe Candy Apples by K as the world's first hard candy candy apple shop. We specialize in the hard candy apple that started out with the traditional carnival treat, and then we've expanded that to different colors, different flavors. According to most historians, American-style candy apples were invented in New Jersey in the early 1900s. They're known for that signature cinnamon-flavored red shell until now. I like the uh, tropical punch. My favorite flavor is turtle. I would certainly say that the variety makes them special. For Kim and Travis, this treat has an especially sweet history. Candy apples have always been a favorite. My husband used to bring them to me when we were dating. And then when I threw his surprise 40th birthday party, I wanted him to have gold candy apples as a favor. We found someone to make them, and then she encouraged me, you know, you can make these yourself. You can do this yourself. Wanting to enjoy candy apples year round, Kim began developing unique candy recipes at home. Her kids, her first taste testers. Eventually, it picked up and neighbors and friends would say, oh, I would buy some from, from you if you have some. And I thought, let me start an Instagram page and see how many people are interested in candy apples. At this point, I'm working full time still uh, as an accountant. And on the weekends, I would start doing markets to offer these candy apples. When Kim got laid off, she saw an opportunity to pursue her dream 
full time. There's never been a storefront that just focused on candy apples and you love going in a cupcake shop and you're like, ooh, all the flavors and the beauty of having the case displayed of all these treats. And I thought that would be so yum to have the same thing, but just in candy apples. Candy Apples by K officially opened in April 2019. A line of eager patrons stretched down the sidewalk on opening day. Any dream of hers, I'm definitely gonna support it. It's gonna become my dream as well. So we took off with it. Today, Kim and her team make over 40 different flavors and rotate their offerings each week. The process starts, of course, with fresh apples that Travis picks up from local farmers markets each weekend. Those are pretty. In our opinion, the Granny Smith apple is the best apple to use. That tart, hard, crisp apple is perfect against sweet candy. The apples are washed thoroughly in vinegar and hot water to remove that waxy coating. And it creates a smooth surface for the candy to be applied to. In the candy apple world, this is a dirty apple and this is a clean apple. The apples need to dry for 24 hours or else the candy coating won't stick properly. And this might just be my opinion, but the more I've dipped, I feel like covering the apple all the way to the stick is ideal for presentation. Kim's candy starts with a base of sugar, corn syrup, and water heated to 300 degrees. Then flavor extracts are added. She's experimented with dozens over the years, including blue raspberry, sour watermelon, and pina colada. And while we couldn't get her to divulge exactly how she gets those eye-popping colors, Kim did reveal one secret. Making sure that you're using bright colors and that your candy is not transparent would also be a key to making sure that you have a beautiful apple. Many apples get a little extra love with candy pieces or nuts. The store now offering a variety of dip treats, including candied grapes and chocolate dipped fruit. But the classics are always on standby. Our family favorites are definitely still the carnival. The turtle, which is caramel, milk chocolate, and pecans, is also a huge favorite. It's one that we can slice and share with everyone. And they really do mean everyone. We have five kids ranging uh, ages 2 to 22. They all contribute something different even to the family business and they're very familiar with candy apples. They're so used to seeing them that I think the five-year-old's first word was apple. It was apple. <laughs> Elena, the couple's oldest, works at the shop. She also handles their social media to help boost business. This is carrot cake. I feel it's really brought her out of her shell. I mean, she was an introvert and very quiet, but this has really blossomed her into being a lot more outgoing and engaging in conversation with customers. The younger kids continue to taste test while Travis pitches in where needed. He works full time, but still in the evenings at night, he's washing apples, he's stocking the store, he's getting all our supplies. I think often like, I don't think I could have done this with anybody else but him. Kim, owing a large part of her success to a generation that came before. Our moms played a huge role as well. Travis's mom was so precise in developing a process and a lot of the ways that we dip and a lot of our little tricks and secrets came from, from her. And then my mom working the store, um, she was actually washing apples as well. She's grateful they were able to enjoy her success early on. Last year, last April, uh, my mother-in-law passed away. And after losing her, that was very traumatic and hurtful for our family. She was the matriarch of the family. And so two weeks later, my mom passed. And we weren't expecting that of you know either situation. We are definitely keeping them a daily part of our lives, remembering everything that they've taught us and instilled in us, um, knowing how uh, tickled they were about how far the business had come. I don't think there's a day that goes by. That we don't talk about them or think about them. A lot of times when we're doing things, we can kind of feel their peaceful spirit with us and encouraging us and pushing us. 
And without that, I don't know that we could continue, you know. And just like their mothers, Kim and Travis are passing down many lessons to their children. I believe some of the things that the kids have learned by watching Kim run the business is resilience, patience, love and passion. You know, a great job managing both. Mm -hmm. Apples are a true American icon. At their core, they're a shining example of innovation and versatility, and their place in U.S. history is one of patriotism and pride. But most of all, they foster a sense of togetherness. This is Cooking Up a Storm. I'm Al Roker. Today, we are turning to one of the most revered chefs of our time to tackle one of the most popular side dishes of the Thanksgiving meal. Joining us, the one, the only, Ina Garten, known to a lot of folks as the Barefoot Contessa. She's so incredibly popular, mainly because she makes great cooking accessible for so many of us. From her popular Food Network show, Barefoot Contessa, to her, I think, 300 cookbooks, <laughs> Uh, Ina reminds us all that being a good cook is within our reach, especially if you follow her recipes. Today, we're going to hone in on a recipe of hers that truly shines, her Parmesan smashed potatoes. Ina, thanks for joining us on the podcast. I'm very flattered. And actually, this recipe is from my first book, The, the Barefoot Contessa Cookbook. Really? It really is. Is Thanksgiving your favorite holiday? Absolutely. Why? It's just to me, unlike Christmas, which has so much going on. Yeah. It's just your favorite people are invited for dinner, and everything is absolutely delicious. It's old-fashioned, but kind mm. of updated in a nice way, the way that, you know, it's mashed potatoes, but they're done a little better than you expect them to be. When they were coming up with the ideas for what recipes we could get, uh, they said, what, what's some of your favorites? And after I rattled off a bunch, uh, one of my producers said, what, what, what about mashed potatoes? I'm not a big fan of the mashed potato uh, because I'm sure you've tried a, a number of things. You've probably not had great mashed potatoes in your time. Well, I just think the key to mashed potatoes is what you add to them mm -hmm. to make them have great flavor. So it's about the flavor, the texture, and I think some two things people really miss a lot in, in almost every recipe is the salt. It needs a lot of salt to give it flavor, mm -hmm. but also it needs something with an edge. Very often it's like lemon zest or something like that. In this one, it's Parmesan cheese. Oh. It's something that's a little sharp that mm -hmm. kind of wakes up your taste buds. But usually mashed potatoes is potatoes, cream, butter, yeah. and not enough salt, and it's boring. So the Parmesan smashed potatoes have texture, they have flavor, the sour cream has kind of a, you know, a tangy edge mm -hmm. to it. So it's really what you bring to it that makes all the difference. In a sense, it seems to me that this recipe is actually easier than oh, mashed so potatoes. much easier. Because first, you don't have to peel them. Mm -hmm. um, second, they cook very quickly because they're small potatoes. And, um, and then you just mix them in a, in a mixer, which is as easy as it gets. When I'm thinking about a recipe, I always have an exact thing in my head, what I'm looking for, and I just keep going until I get there. If mm -hmm. I don't have something that I'm going for, it never ends. I just never, I never get there. So you could actually cut up other potatoes. You could take Yukon Gold potatoes, which have a very creamy texture. I wouldn't peel them, and I, but I would cut them in, in small sizes. So, you know, like a large dice. And so they cook really quickly. Mm -hmm. And then you drain them and put them in the mixer and add everything else. You kind of ad lib about this and you kind of play with it until you get it right. Mm -hmm. uh, and it seems like, to me, cooking lends itself more to that than baking. That would be harder to ad-lib baking. Absolutely, because baking, you put everything in a, in a pan, you put it in the oven, and you hope it's going to work. But cooking, you can kind of add something here, add something there, um, kind of play around with it along the way. For mm, any recipe, what I'm doing is I'm taking the intrinsic ingredients and figuring out how to make them taste better. Mm, it's delicious. A little more salt. I always needs a little more, um, and more like themselves, actually. So my favorite sweet potato recipe is I peel, I, I actually bake sweet potatoes, scoop them out, put them also in the mixer, and add butter and um, chipotle powder mm -hmm. and maple oh. syrup. So they're sweet and spicy, and I think they really complement the sweet potatoes, mm -hmm. which are totally different. So Chipotle you know, smashed sweet potatoes is what they are. They're, sma they're the smashed, smashed sweet too. potato. Because it's got texture. 
I love that. Yeah, they're pretty good. I love to make, um, instead of stuffing for the turkey, I make um, a savory bread pudding, huh. which instead of kind of, you know, kind of like wet and, I mean, stuffing's delicious. Yes. But when you make a bread pudding instead, it's creamy on the bottom and crispy on the top, so it's got more texture. And so I make a, um, a leek and mushroom bread pudding mm. or a, um, an apple and herb bread pudding. So it's got lots of flavors and textures, mm. and it just goes with everything else. Here's my thing on the stuffing. <clears throat> yeah. And, I, and I, again, the, uh, I'm going to talk to Alexander Smalls. Uh, he's making oyster dressing. Uh, he's from the South. Mm-hmm. I grew up in the North. I grew up in New York City. We always called it stuffing. I, and I was like, what is this dressing that people speak of? I don't know. I think it's the same thing. Yeah. I, I think it's just what they refer to it. I think a Southern expression is, is dressing, mm-hmm. and in the North we call it stuffing. And, and see, to me, I could do without the turkey, except <laughs> for I like the turkey to make the stuffing in, but I also do an, a, another big batch of it, like bake it in the oven, and then mix the two. So oh, that that's they're a little wet and dry, and by the time you average it out, it should be the right consistency. The reason why I prefer not to stuff the turkey is because in order to get the, tur- the stuffing cooked, mm-hmm. I feel like you have to overcook the turkey. Right. So if the heat can get into the middle, and I do it the way I do a chick- uh, like a chicken with herbs and lemon and garlic in the, in the cavity, mm-hmm. um, the turkey will cook in like two or two and a half hours. Oh. And so the turkey is really moist. If right. you stuff it, in order to get the stuffing cooked all the way through, and you need to do that mm-hmm. to be safe, um, I feel like the turkey's overcooked. Right. So that's why I like to do the stuffing separately as a bread pudding. I've never heard of anybody dying from... From stuffing, <laughs> I, I, I'm, and they, maybe they did, and the, and the coroner they just didn't, didn't, didn't want to put down death due to stuffing because that would overstuffed. Yeah, very good. <laughs> that was very good. <laughs> yes, and that's why I'm a garden lady, queen, ladies and gentlemen, the queen of cooking. Let's go. This is a critical choke point for this fire. And good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. Hey, podcast fans. Ready to unlock our true crime mysteries? Try Dateline Premium on Apple Podcasts. You'll get early access to originals, plus bonus content. And everything is ad-free. So head to Apple Podcasts now to subscribe. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Hey, podcast fans, ready to unlock our true crime mysteries? Try Dateline Premium on Apple Podcasts. You'll get early access to originals, plus bonus content, and everything is ad-free. So head to Apple Podcasts now to subscribe. Hey, I'm Hallie. It's good to be with you tonight. There's another legal filing today, and I want to cut through some of the weedsy stuff. And let's just, like, get to the point. They have started to vote on the PACT Act. If you're like, Hallie, stop speaking Washingtonese. This bill would basically give health care to veterans who have exposed to these toxic chemicals. Because, Scott, I'm trying to make this as not D.C. as possible. The increased sort of anger that we've seen now in politics. I saw you searching for, I think, your microphone, Danny. You are out. I was you trying to do it on the slide. Live TV, man. It's okay. You get one beautiful life to live. What are you gonna do? This show is so fun, but having you as a positive force means really the world to me. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold, okay? We have this circle of women that love each other. I decided I'm gonna go with the rhythm of life. And you love riding the way. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. I love you. I love you too. <laughs> Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. You've hosted Thanksgiving dinners. What's the one thing that, as host, you need to be cognizant of uh, when it comes to your dinner? I think, particularly for Thanksgiving, but for every dinner, what everybody likes to eat. Because, you know, you've invited people you love. You want to make sure they all have something they love to eat. Sure. So I just think it's, it's important to just make sure everybody's well taken care of. Without them 
feeling singled out mm. as like this is the meal for all of us and okay. that's what you're going to have. Yeah. And so I think that's really true for any dinner, but particularly Thanksgiving. Especially if you're the host. Yeah, because, I mean, I only invite people I love. I want them to be happy. How do we time it out so that everything comes out at the right time together? I literally do when I should start making something and when it should go into the oven, when it should come out. And then I know that everything's done at 730 when everybody arrives. So, And Thanksgiving is actually... Um, a good one to do because you can make the turkey early. You can make the vegetables very often in advance to reheat. Uh, and while the turkey's resting, which is about a half an hour, everything goes back in the oven and reheat, to be reheated. So there's, there's a timing thing that works really well. And then everything goes on the, on the table. I like buffet style mm -hmm. because I think then everybody gets up and gets what they like and they can pass up what they don't like yeah. and then they can come back and they can go have seconds and it's no big deal. I can't imagine this would have happened to you, but have you had anything go wrong me? At Thanksgiving? Something go wrong? Yeah. Never happens. No? No. But I know about other people that things have gone wrong. <laughs> actually, a friend of mine, I had done, actually, the last wedding that I ever catered um, was hers. And um, it was in, a, in, in like October. Mm -hmm. And she called me in November and said, you know, I, I, I want to make a Thanksgiving dinner for my new husband. But um, I just, I don't know. I, never cooked like that. So I said to her, okay, so this is what you do. Think of a turkey as like a large chicken. So <laughs> you're going to cook it the same way you cook a chicken, just for a little longer. So I showed her, uh, told her exactly how to make it. And she put the turkey in the oven and she said to her and her husband, let's go for a walk. It's going to be an hour and then I'll come back and baste it. And she came back and couldn't open the oven door. And it turns out she had set the oven on clean. Oh, no. Not on, not on the temperature I told her to set it on. So her husband had to un, actually literally unscrew the oven door to get the turkey out. And I was like, what did you do? And she said, well, I served it. She said, it was very clean. <laughs> <laughs> so I think everybody has a Thanksgiving disaster story. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, you know, you just get through it and you do, do the best you can. When did you realize you had that knack, that certain something that, you know, to, to entertain, to, to nourish people, to, to give them something besides a plain meal, that, that there was something else attached to it? Well, you know, when I was growing up, I wasn't allowed to cook. Wait, so what? I wasn't allowed to cook. I wasn't allowed in the kitchen. Why? I don't know. I think my mother just wanted me in my room, and she wanted the kitchen to herself. And so she said, well, it's your job to, cook, to study. It's my job to cook and just get out of the kitchen. So I kind of always wanted to do it. And I got married when I was 20. And I think that's when I started to think this is what I'd like to. I love cooking. I taught myself how to cook with, as, as you know, the Craig Claiborne's Mastering, no, Craig Claiborne's um, New York Times cookbook, and then later Julia Child's Mastering the Art of French Cooking. And I just started, you know, I was always working. When I was working in Washington, I'd come home at night and cook. And I just loved it. And at some point, I thought, I want to do this for my work, not just for. Fun. I think what I was craving as a child is connecting with people, and I felt that if you feed them, they always show up, and you have a good time together. And that was the connection I loved. So I kept doing it over and over again. So dinner's over. You got, you know, Tupperware containers of stuff and foil-wrapped packages in your, in your fridge. What do you like to do Thanksgiving leftover was? Well, actually, I have a thing about Thanksgiving leftovers. I think the guests want to have leftovers, too. Ah. So, I mean, I've literally on occasion done a second Thanksgiving dinner where mm -hmm. they have a whole turkey to take home and extra stuffing and extra... Because everybody wants sandwiches the next sure. day, right? So that, and actually one year, we all decided we were going to make, I was going to make Thanksgiving dinner the day before, and we were going to have Thanksgiving dinner was going to be actually turkey sandwiches, <laughs> <laughs> which was really fun. <laughs> so, so where do you stand on the turkey sandwich uh, leftover construction? Uh, what's the best way to maximize? You mean this, this is the flavor profile of the yes. turkey, turkey sandwich? Yes. Good question. I don't think I've ever really studied that. I just put everything on the table and everybody makes their own sandwiches. Uh -huh. So what's your, what's your fr well, flavor profile? I, I like, uh, uh, I start with a, a good crusty bread, Yeah. Uh, mayo, the turkey, some stuffing, yeah, some cranberry sauce. Exactly, it's just what I would. A little do. more mayo, yeah, and then cut it. That sounds great. Yes, that sounds really good. A little sweet, a little every, salty. Every once in a while, I like a little um, uh, chipotle smashed sweet potatoes in there. Ooh, that might be good, right? Ooh, you know, somebody came on the show 
and I think using leftover mash, uh, uh, sweet potatoes, uh, made waffles. Oh, just, I could see that. Yeah, just That's put a great the idea. waffles yeah. in the waffle iron, closed it up. Jeffrey, hey, look, it's no secret. The, the two of you are, I mean, you, you guys are what I think all of us try to aspire to. Well, uh, and that's not thanks, to say well. that you 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 know you guys have a perfect marriage. You like that's you're human. Great. You're human, <laughs> but you have, great. you have a great marriage. It's pretty great. I'm sure people ask you what's the secret. You know, <laughs> Nora Ephron used to say when people asked her about her um, marriage, she'd say it's three words. She she'd say marry an Italian, <laughs> and I would say it's two words: marry Jeffrey. I mean, he's just a sweetheart. He's mm-hmm. just a kind, funny, smart. Um, generous. Uh, he just wants me to be happy. And I want the same thing for him. It's really not complicated. And yet you say he's not your best sounding board when it comes to food. <laughs> if I ask him if he likes something, he always says, this is the most delicious thing you've ever made. So <laughs> I don't trust his taste. <laughs> but I, as a husband, he's perfect. <laughs> there you go. So, so do you guys have, uh, uh, what, what are your Thanksgiving traditions? Um, it, you know, so for a long time, there was a family we were very close to, and, and they, I would invite them and the kids and the grandkids, and we would all have a wonderful time. But because of COVID, we couldn't do that anymore. And so um, it was, you know, it's just the two of us mm-hmm. or some close friends that were in a pod with us. Um, but we keep it, I mean, I kind of like a nice Thanksgiving for two, frankly. Mm-hmm. When, when Jeffrey and I lived in Washington in the 70s, um, and, you know, we had to work on Friday, we couldn't go home to our families. His family lived in Florida. My family lived in Connecticut. Couldn't go home for a day. So we would have Thanksgiving just to ourselves. And we would just walk all over. It was like a tradition. We'd walk all over Washington. It was always a gorgeous, crisp fall day. And we would end up at some tavern somewhere and have Thanksgiving dinner. And it was, I just remember those as really special days. What are you thankful for this Thanksgiving? Oh, so much. I mean, people have had such a hard time, and we were very fortunate that we could keep ourselves safe. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, my life has changed dramatically because Jeffrey used to leave East Hampton on Monday and come back on Friday, and he's been there the entire time. And I always kind of wondered, what's it going to be like when he moves home? Because we've done this for 40 years, and it's been heaven. I mean, I just have my buddy around all the time, which is just wonderful. We've been really fortunate, and that we've both been able to work. We've really been incredibly lucky. What is your favorite Thanksgiving dish? It's not the turkey, although I make a pretty good turkey. I think I'm thinking probably leek and mushroom bread puddings right up there and the chipotle smashed sweet potatoes and roasted Brussels sprouts. I'd say those three things together are just say Thanksgiving to me. What are your favorites? You know, I would say my mother made this dish. Everybody laughs about it at the show (laughs) uh, because of the name. It was basically a crustless sweet potato pie, but it was called it's called sweet potato poon, and and you know it's got crushed pineapple in it and cinnamon and and uh, and it, you could serve it either as a side dish or like a dessert. Yeah. Uh, but it always had uh, uh, slightly broiled marshmallows on top, and as kids we always thought it was funny to distract my mom uh, <laughs> when she put the poon under the broiler. So that it would catch Burn. fire. <laughs> it would catch fire. You know? <laughs> we thought, That's Mom, just hilarious yeah, when we, you're a kid. When you're a kid, <laughs> and to be honest, when we became adults, we still found it <laughs> hilarious. Hey, I'm Hallie. It's good to be with you tonight. There's another legal filing today, and I want to cut through some of the weedsy stuff. And let's just like get to the point. They have started to vote on the PACT Act. If you're like, Hallie, stop speaking Washingtonese. This bill would basically give health care to veterans who have exposed to these toxic chemicals. Just got, I'm trying to make this as not D.C. as possible. The increased sort of anger that we've seen now in politics. I saw you searching for, I think, your microphone, Dan. Yeah. You are oh, I was you trying got to it. do it on the slide. Live TV, man. It's OK. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. You get one beautiful life to live. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold. We have this circle of women that love each other. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Love ya. Love you too. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now.
Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Hey, I'm Hallie. It's good to be with you tonight. There's another legal filing today, and I want to cut through some of the weedsy stuff. And let's just like get to the point. They have started to vote on the PACT Act. If you're like Hallie, stop speaking Washingtonese. This bill would basically give health care to veterans who have exposed to these toxic chemicals. Just got, I'm trying to make this as not DC as possible. The increased sort of anger that we've seen now in politics. I saw you searching for, I think, your microphone, Danny. You are out of trying to do it on the slide. Live TV, man, it's okay. You get one beautiful life to live. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold. We have this circle of women that love each other. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Love ya. <laughs> you get one beautiful life to live. What are you gonna do? This show is so fun, but having you as a positive force means really the world. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold, okay? We have this circle of women that love each other. I decided I'm gonna go with the rhythm of life. And you love riding the I way. Love to ride. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Love you. Yeah. <laughs> Here's what you'll need for my Parmesan smashed potatoes. Three pounds, small red potatoes, unpeeled. One tablespoon, plus two teaspoons kosher salt. One and a half cups of half and half. Quarter of a pound of unsalted butter, that's one stick. Half a cup of sour cream. Half a cup of freshly grated Parmesan cheese. It's actually ground Parmesan cheese. And half a teaspoon of freshly ground black pepper. So how did you come sour up with Sour cream, I don't know, I just thought, how can we make smashed potatoes better? Mm -hmm. So it's got great texture, it's got great flavor. Uh, I'm gonna show you how to make them. Well, let's do it. So and then if you hate them, we'll make something I, else. How's that? I've never hated anything you've made, so I'm- I'm, oh, good. I'm thank I'm, you. I'm, I'm, I'm fairly confident that these are going to be fantastic. So, so what are you starting I, What I'm start with is three pounds of these little, um, I think they're called red beet potatoes. They're uh -huh. small potatoes. Are they kind of like the, a, a red version of like new potatoes? They're new potatoes, uh -huh. yeah. I don't know why they're called new potatoes, but professionally they're called red beet. They're small red potatoes. Right. Now, if you, could you use a different potato? You could, but the red potato has like a very thin skin, so, mm -hmm. and we're not peeling them. We're gonna uh, leave the skin on Oh, it. interesting. So, which makes it so much easier and actually more delicious. Okay, uh, so, wait a minute, I need salt. Oh, so we gotta put, put salt. A tablespoon of salt in. Okay. Okay, so I'm just gonna bring that to a boil and let it cook for like 25, 35 minutes until they're, like, until they're really tender. They've been boiling. And I just, I test it with a skewer or a little sharp knife, uh -huh. something like that. Let's see if they're done. Yeah, perfectly tender, all the way through. If they scream, they're done. <laughs> so can you hear a potato screaming? Yeah, that's right. If you listen closely. <laughs> okay. Ah, no, don't do that. Okay, so I'm just gonna drain them. So while you drain them, I'm gonna combine one and a half cups of half and half, mm -hmm. and a stick of butter, quarter wow. of a pound of butter. I mean, you know, I they're like mashed that. potatoes after all. Hold on, we're gonna listen to this drain. Okay. Oh, into the colander. <laughs> don't, don't pour them down the sink. Perfect. All right. And they go right into that bowl. Okay, now you've got you've got a, a mixture. I can't do the really difficult part, right? I've got a, um, a KitchenAid mixer. Okay. And we're gonna put a... Oh, there's a paddle a attachment. Paddle attachment on it, exactly. Just like that. And in the meantime, I'm gonna heat up one and a half cups of half and half and an entire stick of butter. Because you can. Because you can. Now, when you're and heat, you know, when you, you know heat, what Julia Child said. What does she say? She said, when people say to me, I don't want to use butter, what should I use? She says, well, just use cream. <laughs> <laughs> fat is fat. <laughs> it's, so I'm going to turn this on. Do we know how to do this? Yeah, and then okay. you turn it. Just until it gets hot. Because okay. you don't want to put cold cream and butter into the potatoes, okay. into the warm potatoes, because it'll congeal the whole thing. Oh. So, so this is what I do. I'm just going to put the paddle attachment down. Mm -hmm and just very slowly just mix them up, so just so they break up a lot. So that's why they're called smashed. Ah. So you don't even have to puree them. So they have lots of texture, the skins are in it, and then as soon as it's kind of mashed up like that, on a very low speed, mm -hmm. and this is hot, we're gonna pour that into this. So they look better already, it, don't they? It than really regular looks, mashed yes. It's, it's got some texture. It's got texture to it. I don't yes. like mashed potatoes. I mean, sometimes you want something that's really silky and pureed, mm -hmm. but sometimes you want something for texture. Sure. And since this is Thanksgiving, we're looking for texture, yes. right? 
Boom. Boom. Okay. So now let's see if we can get this all over ourselves. Okay, great. At the same time. <laughs> and then I'm going to pour three quarters of it in. Okay. Just really slowly into the potatoes, and then I'm going to fold more in if it, if I need it. Now, what's the difference between pouring and folding? Um, I'm, folding is I'm going to take it off the mixer and then uh, fold it in with a with a you know like a, um, a spatula. A spatula. Okay. Yeah. So okay, so that's that. That's it? That's it, yeah. And then I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna fold the rest of the ingredients in. Let's see if I have a little spatula. I'm just gonna take all the potatoes, you wanna get all of them. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna take this off the mixing. Now, could you make this ahead of time, Ida? Actually, you can. You know what it is, is there are a couple of things you can do. You could put it in a baking dish, uh -huh. cover it with a little, um, sprinkle it with a little uh, Parmesan cheese right. and put it in the oven and reheat it. Oh. But you know, the easiest thing is to take a bowl, mm -hmm. a heat proof bowl, put it on a pot of boiling water like a bain marie right. and just keep it warm for like half an hour. And just, I just add a little more milk or cream or something mm -hmm. like that to keep it thin. Or butter. Or butter. Yeah. <laughs> Butter's always good. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, now yeah. I'm going to add two things that are going to be great flavor mm -hmm. half a cup of sour cream because sour cream's always good. Could right? you substitute like a, a, a full fat yogurt or something? Uh, sure, I bet to? you could, yeah. And a half a cup of Parmesan cheese. Ah. And lots of salt and pepper, two teaspoons of salt. Oh, and you wanna do the pepper? And about a teaspoon of pepper, a lot of pepper. That sounds good, right? I like it, listen to that. <laughs> that's a really nice pepper mill. Perfect, oh, I think that's it the final pepper. <laughs> and then you want to get the, the rest of the milk and cream, and we're just going to add it until it's really nice and creamy. Let's see. Okay. Is, can you over mix your, your, your sweet potatoes? Um, you can't over mix sweet potatoes. I mean, but, I'm sorry, not sweet. Um, I meant uh, Potatoes have starch in it, and mm -hmm. if you over mix, I would just put all of it on. I oh. think it really needs it. Yeah. Because they're, they're really kind of thick. You want them really creamy. Mm -hmm. So, here we go. We want to taste it, make sure it's right. I, I mean, that was pretty easy. For yeah, that really was. Smashed and, potatoes and, and no peeling mm -hmm. and just um, and mixed in the mixer. Yeah. Okay, let's see. So, you want to try it? Sure. Try it and see how it is. We're not even going to put it on a dish. <laughs> Gentlemen, going, start your please, forks. Please, please. <laughs> see, now that's good. It's not so bad, right? No, and it's got a little cheesy. Just, and just also the sour cream has a little bit of um, a tang to mm -hmm. it. And the Parmesan cheese. It's pretty good. I think See, that's, that's fantastic. Good. Thank you. That is Have really I good. converted you? Thank you. you. So I was thinking we'd put it in a saute pan to keep okay. it nice and warm. Mm -hmm. How's that? Is that a good idea? Sure. Okay. Yeah. You got the are you in charge of that? Uh, yes. Okay. You're in charge of that. I mean, you can put it in a big bowl, but I thought it's very Thanksgiving to serve it in a pan. And then if you want to reheat it, yeah, you just put it right, right in the oven. How's that? The last thing to clean. You've done this before, right? Well, once or twice. <laughs> Although I'm, I'm the type of person in my house, it, it rarely makes it from a bowl. <laughs> the chef has to taste it first, right? That looks fantastic. Does that look good? And maybe a little Parmesan cheese on top, mm -hmm. or I don't know if we have any left. I used it all. A little salt. I think the difference in great food and okay food is generally salt. We had a, oh, here we go, hold uh, on. Uh, we have a little more. We have food, we have food fairies right here who bring in <laughs> this stuff, like that, just like that. The food, food fairies. Food, food fairies, huh? Okay, go. A little Parmesan cheese on top. You know what it is? I like when people know what it is mm -hmm. by what's, what's on top. Oh, okay. So, so they know it's of, gonna be Parmesan. You give them a visual cue. Yeah, perfect. So well. <laughs> oh my gosh. Parmesan good. smashed potatoes. Wow, could you could you put that like say under the broiler and just kinda Yeah, you could. Get, get a, a little, little crusty top, crusty give it a little top. more texture. And, and actually the cheese would melt a little bit, which would be good. Wow. Good idea. Oh boy. <laughs> get out of the way, Jeffrey. <laughs> <laughs> I'm coming to town. <laughs> Well, Ina, this has been just delightful. That's been so much fun. Thank you so much for inviting me on your first podcast. Well, thank you. And, and, <laughs> and I hope you and Jeffrey have a fantastic Thanksgiving. Thank you. And you to Deborah and, and your family, too. Thanks so much. Thank you. It's been really fun. Grab your 
tapered for a new podcast, Cooking Up a Storm with Al Roker. My forecast, yummy. Some of the best chefs spill the beans on family secrets to get you ready for Thanksgiving. This is fun. Bringing the heat for the holidays. Listen now, wherever you get your podcasts. So here's the deal. When we started thinking about this podcast, there was one chef in particular I really wanted to talk with. I have known uh, Alexander Smalls for almost 30 years and have been at his table. He's been at my table uh, more times than I can count. Uh, <laughs> he is a chef. He's a restaurateur, a restaurant owner, cookbook author, an accomplished opera singer. He is everything that is New York. Uh, and what I love most about him and his work is his commitment to making every meal an occasion. And he takes what he's known from his travels around the world to his upbringing in South Carolina, in low country, uh, and he considers each and every detail just as important. As and so, to me, the most important part of a Thanksgiving meal is stuffing. And I knew if I went to Alexander and said, Alexander, what's your go-to? He would bring something spectacular, and he would bring something that's inspired by the flavors of his own childhood. So, uh, low country oyster cornbread dressing with crispy slab bacon. Ladies and gentlemen, Alexander Smalls. Welcome <laughs> to Cooking Up a Storm, my friend. I am the bacon. <laughs> <laughs> well, you certainly are a bit of a ham, so we'll, we'll go with that. Uh, hey. <laughs> what, what's your favorite part of the Thanksgiving meal? Oh, my God, eating. <laughs> um, but uh, if I walk backwards from that, um, I love preparation. Mm -hmm. I menu shopping, uh, the prep work, and it starts days in advance. Um, so I love that whole mm -hmm. um, ballet, really. Um, I love it. And then, of course, there's nothing like laying the spread out on the table. I mean, it's like festive and full and celebratory. When you were a kid growing up, yeah. what was the part of the meal, the, the, the dish that you couldn't wait for? Oh, well, no surprise. The dressing. <laughs> <laughs> the dressing. The dressing had the most flavors. It had the juice of the turkey. It had the gravy mm -hmm. of the turkey. Um, it was full of, of savory um, uh, 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 spices and aromatics and excuse to pile tons of cranberry sauce on top. Yeah. <laughs> well, so here's the thing. I grew up uh, here in, in New York. And my mom called it stuffing. You call it dressing. Are they the same thing? They are. They're just prepared differently. And what I mean by that is the stuffing goes inside the cavity of the bird, mm -hmm. and dressing goes in a casserole dish. Um, and it also is a different texture because the dressing dries out more and has a crispy uh, crust, uh, and sometimes the topping is also crispy. Um, so it's a side dish mm -hmm. as opposed to being part of a dish. <laughs> okay, because see, it, it, what I've always done is I like to make my stuffing in the turkey, right. but I make enough of it, like double it, right. and then bake it in the oven and then combine the two. So you kind of get the wet, but the juices of the turkey and everything, and then, but the drier part so that they average out. Mm -hmm. Dressing purists, uh -huh. they, it would never touch the Are stuff. there dressing purists? Well, there's one. <laughs> <laughs> and you're the only person I know that mixes stuffing and dressing. So. Maybe I'm a trendsetter. Maybe you Maybe I'm are. ahead of the curve. <laughs> yeah. 
beyond the curve. <laughs> when you have make this this dressing, because it, it it's got a lot of flavor profile to it. Almost in in some ways, it, it probably stands out more than a lot of side dishes mm. most people would have. Mm. How do you adjust the other dishes that you're making for Thanksgiving so that this is un- unless you want this to be the centerpiece? Well, I don't adjust things because, first of all, I mean, it's an ensemble piece, mm-hmm. um, uh, every meal that you cook. But then, you know, you always have solos and you have stars. This is a star dish, you know, um, not for everyone, because mm-hmm. some people just simply throw some 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 fruit and some breadcrumbs and call it a day. Um, but for me, this is a complete, um, you know, uh, satisfying dish that could stand on its own. Um, so I, I can't say that I um, hold back on my other dishes, but uh-huh. I balance it because, you know, this is what I do. I mean, I, I know how to balance a plate of food. <laughs> Literally and figuratively. <laughs> Voila. <laughs> so, you know, again, this dish, what I, I, I find fascinating in that it really does harken back to your upbringing, yeah. especially with the oysters. The oysters have a certain uh, connection for you and your dad. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, th- my father created and, and well I should say it is out of his tradition that uh, the oyster cornbread dressing I mean this is one of the few things my father my father had maybe five dishes mm-hmm. that he made supremely they were just unbelievable and and he made nothing else if you asked him to boil water it would be questionable but those <laughs> five <laughs> dishes and they were all these low country you know heirloom recipes and we used to sit at the dining room table, uh, sorry, the kitchen table, um, and shuck oysters, you know, together. Um, he and my grandfather would make a trip down to the, uh, to the um, what we used to call the um, old country, uh, down to Beaufort, South Carolina, where our relatives had all this property and land, and they would fish and do all this stuff. And uh, they would come back with just baskets. All this stuff would be going on. So it comes out of that kind of ritual. Mm -hmm. And my dad and I would sit at the table and he taught me how to pop oysters at an early age. He'd start them. Then he'd give me the back of a spoon, literally, and let me pop open. And, uh, And then we would save the oysters and the juice my mother would be simmering milk, for mm-hmm. example, for oyster stew or, or a, a broth in order to make it for the low country, you know, uh, oyster cornbread stuffing. Hey, podcast fans, ready to unlock our true crime mysteries? Try Dateline Premium on Apple Podcasts. You'll get early access to originals plus bonus content and everything is ad free. So head to Apple Podcasts now to subscribe. Hey, I'm Hallie. It's good to be with you tonight. There's another legal filing today, and I want to cut through some of the weedsy stuff. But let's just, like, get to the point. They have started to vote on the PACT Act. If you're like, Hallie, stop speaking Washingtonese. This bill would basically give health care to veterans who have exposed to these toxic chemicals. Scott, I'm trying to make this as not D.C. as possible. The increased sort of anger that we've seen now in politics. I saw you searching for, I think, your microphone, Danny. You are out. I was you trying to it. do it on the slide. Live TV, man. It's okay. You get one beautiful life to live. What are you going to do? This show is so fun, but having you as a positive force means really the world to me. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold, okay? We have this circle of women that love each other. I decided I'm going to go with the rhythm of life. And you love riding the way. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Yeah, I love you too. Good evening from New Orleans. Nice to go really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. Hey, I'm Hallie. It's good to be with you tonight. There's another legal filing today, and I want to cut through some of the weedsy stuff. But let's just like get to the point. They have started to vote on the pact. 
back. If you're like, Kelly, stop speaking Washingtonese. This bill would basically give health care to veterans who have exposed to these toxic chemicals. Just got, I'm trying to make this as not D.C. as possible. The increased sort of anger that we've seen now in politics. I saw you searching for, I think, your microphone, Danny. You are, oh, I was you trying to do it on the slide. Live TV, man. It's okay. Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. You know, one of the people that had an impact on you, and, and I was fortunate, I really consider myself fortunate to have met and talked to uh, Edna Lewis, mm. who was the uh, doyenne, the godmother of, uh, of, of Southern cooking. Yes, absolutely. Um, and, 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 was, and I was funny because she was, when I met her, she was working at what was, I think, the longest running, oldest running uh, 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 restaurant in New York, Gage and Tolner, Gage and Tolner. in Brooklyn. Right. W- what was her influence on you? Wow. Well, it was everything. I mean, she essentially is the essence of farm to table, you know, and uh, in her books, she uh, documented, you know, uh, the the ritual of farming and its importance and, and its profound um, uh, imprint on on Southern uh, African uh, American uh, people, and she 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 kept those traditions alive, and she brought them uh, into into view uh, uh, and into uh, some of the best uh, touted restaurants. Uh, she preserved those recipes, and at the same time, she was um, you know a, a beautiful. Uh, elegant, grand woman. Oh, yeah. And she uh, was kind of a guiding light, if you will. What's the one thing people need to know if they're going to host Thanksgiving dinner this year? Oh, well, first of all, you have to offer variety because you have people with so many uh, limitations or, or concerns. But then I have some of my vegan friends who've come to dinner and but you know i make sure i have tons of vegetables you know legumes lots of beans lots of non-protein products to to be very satisfying and in some instances you know uh, i might make the vegetarian version of my dressing alexander what's the one thing you you try to do every year for thanksgiving i would say that you know, in a world where I'm constantly going and moving around, I try really hard to be home so I can give Thanksgiving to my friends who are in the city. You know, um, I've always been that way since a kid. Uh, I would call my parents up and say, I'm not coming home. There's so many of the orphans who uh, don't have anywhere to go, so I'm cooking for them. And, and, and it's something I still enjoy. So I try to be at home so I can open the door, whether it's for six people, you know, or 30. Last year, Thanksgiving, for a lot of people, was not Thanksgiving, in in a sense. You know, we couldn't be with family. We couldn't be with friends. Do you think that there will be a, a, a more deeper meaning and, and import to Thanksgiving this year? I hope so. I mean, if I could wish um, anything, uh, it would be that um, that those honored traditions uh, that you know people have um, sort of assigned and gifted the occasion of, of gathering. Um, you know, when they do this year, uh, they remember and and really. Uh, are thankful for the grace of being able to come together again. I mean, we need that. Hey, podcast fans, ready to unlock our true crime mysteries? Try Dateline Premium on Apple Podcasts. You'll get early access to originals, plus bonus content, and everything is ad-free. So head to Apple Podcasts now to subscribe.
from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight and expert analysis. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the press now. Streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. You get one beautiful life to live. What are you going to do? This show is so fun, but having you as a positive force means really the world. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold, okay? We have this circle of women that love each other. I decided I'm going to go with the rhythm of life. And you love riding the I way. love riding. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Oh, yeah, I love you too. <laughs> For breaking news in our changing world, Download the NBC News app. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Hey, podcast fans. Ready to unlock our true crime mysteries? Try Dateline Premium on Apple Podcasts. You'll get early access to originals, plus bonus content. And everything is ad-free. So head to Apple Podcasts now to subscribe. How did you come up with this? I didn't have to. It's traditional. I made this dish with my father, not my mother, with my father. Really? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, he was the low country expert. Uh -huh. and, uh, and the big thing was, was the oysters. Oysters were a big thing, you know, but it's traditional. So, you know, it's second nature for me. Mm. Wow. Yeah. All right. Well, you know, it's because it, it's somewhat, it makes a, a very dramatic presentation. <laughs> uh, and, and what people, you are probably, to the best of my knowledge, the only chef, professional chef I know, who's also a professional opera singer. I may be the only one. The only one I know. <laughs> <laughs> so how did you transition from opera to singing? I well, mean, from opera to, 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 to being a chef. Yeah, well, you know, um, I have seen life through two lenses, music and food. And in fact, in my last cookbook, I bring all that together, Meals, Music and Muses, where essentially I talk about my life through the lens of music genres, opera, gospel, you know. Um, uh, so as a kid, you know, I started taking classical piano and that then evolved into my desire to sing and to sing opera. In the meanwhile, I had lots of chefs in my family and food was everything. You grow up in South Carolina in a small one horse town, you know, everything evolved around the table and food and everything happened there. I learned early that the person who had the power was the person who wheeled the spoon in the kitchen. Ah. I wanted that. I wanted that. All right. Well, <laughs> so this is how it all came together. So you've got the power here now. Yes. We're making this. What? How do we get started, Allie? Okay. All right. Well, let me swap places okay. with you. Swapping. Okay. All right. Let's start right here. This is this is easy. All right. So I'm gonna first uh, basically spray this pan like that, and then just with a little cooking. Yeah, spray. just a little cooking spray, uh -huh. you know. And then I'm gonna take some of this aluminum foil and cover it here because because I don't like to clean up. And you're, so you're, you're basically baking uh, uh, slab bacon. I am basically baking slab bacon, okay, absolutely. So you, you line the pan, and now you're putting one of those great little grid I wire am. mesh things. Now, may I have my spray back? Yes, you may. <laughs> I was just trying to keep things clean. OK, all right, so here we go. So you're spraying the, the, I'm spraying the wire grid. I am not having my bacon stick uh -uh. at all. I'll give you this too. Okay. All right. So here we go. So the trick is basically to lay them out in such a way that they have space. Okay. How much bacon do you use? Well, um, again, for a casserole dish that's about nine inches by 13, we're doing about a cup. Okay. Now, you know, this is going to cook and it's going to get smaller. Yeah, I'm going to do this a little faster. It's going to get smaller, mm -hmm. and so this is why you want to cut it at least an inch wide and a third thick, you know, so that you really have a nice bite. Yes. Okay. Although I will admit, I would, I would double or triple that because 
I will probably eat some of this <laughs> as, as well, we exactly, cook. Exactly, exactly. So but go. that's a chef's secret. Ah, all, right? all right. So then I'm going to put this in a 375 degree oven. Okay, for about Okay, how long? that's been preheated. Mm -hmm. You know, well, I want it to get really crisp up. So I, you know, I mean, of course, as a chef, do I time anything? No. But let's just say that it needs to be in there a good 25 minutes, okay. something like that. And it's going to come out looking like this? It's going to come out looking like that. Right. Now, is this crispy enough? No. Oh. And in case you were wondering why this cast iron skillet is here. I was. Please, okay. do the honors. Because what we're going to do now is um, essentially crisp it up even more because it has to withstand a lot of liquid, ah. and it needs to stay firm and somewhat crunchy okay. so we can really have that texture working, you know, both as something you feel in your mouth, but right. also your taste. Okay. So this will do this for about 20 minutes. We'll check on it later. Now, I see oysters here that are uh, 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 un, uh, un, un, unshucked. I know, How I know. hard is it to shuck an oyster? Well, you know, I started shucking oysters with my father as a kid. And I loved it. I mean, I was a kid. I was like five, six years old. But I mean, there we were. And he would give, he would start them for me. And then uh -huh. he'd give me the, the back of the knife or, or the teaspoon. And I would pry open. Uh -huh. And the, 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 the thing about uh, oysters is uh, that, let's see. So you want to get into that little area there and twist. And boom, look at that. Is it happening for you, Al? <laughs> okay. Okay. So here is the oyster. So right. we, we're going to take this oyster out, right. but we're going to keep the juice. So how many of these are we going to do for this dish? Well, you need about 18 to 23. Okay. You know, and, you wait, know, and this wait, is 18 to 23. Why wouldn't it just be 24? Well, I'll tell you why. Because you know, you're buying them by the pound or the pint, and that's how they come. <laughs> you know, whatever. <laughs> but if you put 26 <laughs> in there, who cares, right? All right. So move okay. along with moving, me. Moving. So that juice is going to go over in okay, here. Okay, we got some juice, juice there. Yes, yes, it will. have some here. All right. So here we go. So these are the vegetables that okay. occupy this dish here. And and this is celery, this is uh, red bell peppers, onions, and I like a lot of corn. Even though I have huh. corn in my cornbread, mm -hmm. I like a lot of corn. So it's optional, the okay. corn. But I put that in, I sauteed it in some butter, you know, just so it got uh, nice and translucent, to blah, 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 maybe 10 minutes at most. Boom, that. Right. And now we come over here. Mm -hmm. Now the, what's going on in this bowl is that We've um, we baked some buttermilk cornbread, right? And I like to use bread as day old, okay. all right, because again it adds to the texture mm -hmm. and it helps to to really stand up to all the liquid. Okay, so the the, the white bread has been torn mm -hmm. and then it has been uh, uh, either left out right. or toasted, mm -hmm. you know, just a little bit. You don't want the color, no. but again, you want the texture. Right. So we combine these in here. Okay. okay. So the next thing that happens is that we uh, th we have chicken stock yes and we have the oyster uh, juice, juice mm -hmm. and uh, we're going to combine these essentially right. to um, to get two cups now what I need you to do yes. Al, is is grab those eggs okay and basically put those eggs in here can you see those numbers <laughs> yes yes that's two cups oh good that's what I thought. Okay, and then we have a little whisk over here, and I do mean little. Goodness gracious. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what they say about a man and his whisk. <laughs> boom, boom, boom. Thank you very much. All right, so then we're going to get well, on with the business of it. We got a bigger one over here. Hold on. That's all right. I'm making progress. Oh, you got it? All right, I'm going to give it to you, because what I'm going to do is take our vegetables mm -hmm. there's so much flavor in here oh and i forgot to mention that i have grape tomatoes oh. in here again now that wasn't a low country thing that's an alexander thing mm -hmm. a little more texture you know a little more uptown with it all mm. do you smell the sage well oh, rosemary it's all in here celery seeds you know you follow the recipe. Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay, that looks good. I'll give me some of that. All right, all at once? Or? Well, give me half. Okay. Oh. Doesn't that smell good? It does. All right, give me more. Okay. <laughs> give me more. <laughs> give, me, give me all now, of it. When do we add the bacon? Oh. 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 No, no, go ahead. Keep going. Yeah, give it all to me. All righty. 
Now, this is toasted really well, so it's really picking it up nicely. So this is kind of like a, a, a casserole. Yeah, well, you know, uh, I mean, but again, you could put this in your turkey. Mm -hmm. All would be well. <laughs> all would be well. All would be well. <laughs> 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 yes, indeed. Okay, we've got this mixed up. Good. Now, you've got all this. There's some, there's some other spices, seasoning. Yes, right? yes, okay. Look there. That's, this is the cayenne. Mm -hmm. You want to, isn't that wonderful? Because you know, you know, the food really has mm -hmm. to speak to you. How so much you salt do we want? Want that in? flavor? Just a teaspoon. Okay. Yeah, a flat one. Mm-hmm. Pepper. Wonderful. Yes. Just eyeball it. You know, give us some of that. That looks good. Yeah. Okay, Al. All now right. the nutmeg. Oh. So now the nutmeg needs to be grated, okay. as you know. Mm -hmm. You know, you want to give it a go? Sure. All right. Mm. And you can eyeball that. We do about a teaspoon, a flat teaspoon. Okay. Yes. Oh, my goodness. The listen smell the, of that. And listen to the sound of it. Mmm. It sounds like I'm scratching. That's special. <laughs> All right, you've scratched enough. Wonderful. Right. Okay. And our last but not least, ah. the crispy bacon. Oh, the crispy bacon. Oh, no. We must have the crispy bacon because that's going to give us that depth of flavor. All right. So now this goes in there. Okay. Just half. Just half. Of right. That. Because we have to do our oysters. So you just kind of layer it in. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What we'll do. Okay. And then we just stagger our oysters so that uh, they're not, they don't reach the ends because mm -hmm. we don't want them to cook on the end. Ah. So we just stagger them in there. And of course, as the chef, you always know where they are. Yes. Hello. Hello, oysters. <laughs> mm. I'm going to enjoy you in just a little bit. <laughs> oh, that's looking good. Yes, We've layered that. We've layered, and now we're going to finish ah. it off like this. Ta da, ta da, ta da. Okay, you can spread that okay. out. It smells fantastic. Right. I mean, it hasn't even cooked yet. No, and it's then going to go into the oven on 375. And cook. here is our finished product. Yes. It's warm, but there you go. Look at that. Now tell me it's everything you imagined. And so much more. And so much more. So oh, much more. and we have some wonderful side treats. Yeah, I love it with cranberry. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then we have some giblet gravy. So, oh, look at that. There you go. Smell the corn. Mm -hmm. Gravy on the side. A little gravy on there. I'll have some of that out. Mm -hmm. Some pan brown gravy. Look at that. Where do you stand on your cranberry sauce? Do you like the canned or do you have to make it fresh? I have to make it. Mm -hmm. Well, because I have to put all kinds of things in it. You know. I mean, I like sometimes to have a little orange relish. Sometimes I want um, a pear um, and lots of brandy. <laughs> <laughs> a bourbon. Now tell me what you think. Oh, that's good. To be or not to be. Oh my. Hmm. hmm. That is an opera for the mouth. It's got a nice spice to it. Hmm. I mean, it's a meal. Right in itself. <laughs> my gosh. It's got protein, it's got carbs, it's got vegetables. This is a completely rounded meal. And it has bacon. That's the secret <laughs> ingredient. Mm. Whether it's dressing, stuffing, duffing, or stressing, this is fantastic. There you go. Mm. Yeah. What are you most thankful for? This? Grace. I have truly been 
blessed and gifted to continue doing uh, the things that I, I'm driven to do, that I have a passion for. Um, I'm excited that the work I do continues. I'm thankful for that. Well, we are thankful for you, for your contributions. This stuffing, dressing is fantastic. <laughs> and uh, I, I'm looking forward to just spending more time getting to see folks like you hanging out. Me too, Al. It is good to see you, Alexander Smalls. Thank you. Thank you for being part of Cooking Up a Storm. I've enjoyed it. Up a storm. <laughs> Ahead of the curve. <laughs> for a new podcast, Cooking Up a Storm with Al Roker. I forecast, yummy. Some of the best chefs spill the beans on family secrets to get you ready for Thanksgiving. Didn't fun. Bringing the heat for the holidays. Listen now, wherever you get your Most people will agree that the table isn't truly set for this holiday without something green making its way onto the menu. But not just any green. We're not talking some stinking side salad. No, no. This green needs to hold its own texture, flavor. With that in mind, I asked one of my best friends and chef, his name Marcus Samuelson ring a bell? Oh yes, it does. Restaurant owner, raconteur. He is bringing his A vegetable game. We're talking caramelized Brussels sprouts. Now, while Everybody's used to Brussels sprouts Thanksgiving. I mean, yeah, I got Marcus Samuelson here. And so he is bringing the flavor with greens and color and texture that is going to blow your mind. He is a true celebrity chef. Stuff of legends here in New York after opening the famed Red Rooster restaurant in Harlem. And I am thrilled he is joining us today on Cooking Up a Storm. Marcus, thank you for being here. Al, I'm so excited to be here. And, um, uh... I just love this new space. Like it's a podcast, but we're cooking on TV it's and video. Sound it's and video. It's everything. That's right. It's a, and we can talk. We can talk kind of like our FM. Well, radio you got to stay on the mic. Stay on the mic. Stay on the mic. Stay on the yes. mic. Don't drop the mic. Stay on the mic. Yeah. Uh, listen, I've I've been a big fan of yours. You've you've been on the Today Show. Gosh, for the last almost two decades. Uh, but but this dish. When, when it came to creating something like this, what was your inspiration? Well, um, I think, first of all, thank you for having me. And Brussels is this type of thing that I think it came back, what, 10 years ago or so? Mm -hmm. And I grew up with a grandmother that taught me how to cook. She was amazing. I love Helga. But Brussels was not my thing. They mm -hmm. were overcooked. They were soggy, never delicious. Yeah, they stunk. They stunk, yeah. exactly. And now cook them like just slightly undercooked, just a little bit of crunch, right? And all we're doing with this was just adding great texture. So the pomegranate is there for texture and color. The peanuts that we're adding in, <laughs> great texture. And then we're caramelizing it. Mm -hmm. For regular people like me with maple syrup, fancy people like you, <laughs> you get, you know, you're getting your like, you know, your fancy sugars from you know, that's right. I, I've, I've actually bred my own my own honeybees. There you go. And, and they're they're designer bees. Yeah. And, and that's that's where I get my honey. That's very. But tell me about this. One of the great parts of this is the texture. And and we're talking, you know, peanuts. But what if there's like a nut allergy? Yeah. Is there something? You great could... question. So I think understanding textures can come from many different places. So, for example, a pumpkin seed. Mm -hmm. Right. You can a sunflower seed would be great. You know, things like that. And of course. If you want to be that guy, you can add bacon. Yes, because <laughs> I am that guy. That, that guy. <laughs> I am that guy. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna lie. Yes. I like. To, I like to you know, come yeah. up uh, about a pound of a uh, uh, you know slab bacon yeah. and render it a little bit, and then finish it off when I'm roasting the uh, the Brussels. Bread. And I think most of us are like that. We're really true flexitarians, right? Mm -hmm. We're not just one thing. No. So, but here's a vegan, total vegan recipe that is super delicious because with Thanksgiving. In your case, it could be a new family member sure. or it could be other people coming. That Somebody drops like, by unexpectedly. Somebody drops by. And we don't know for religious reasons or for allergies or for whatever it is, right? So I like to have a couple of side dishes that everyone, and when I say everybody, everyone can eat it. When you do something vegan, majority of people can eat it. Yeah. I think the other interesting thing about this dish is the, the predominant spice 
of uh, Burberry. Yes. So, now, what is that? Great. So the Burberry is really, it's the same identity, and I would say, that mole has in Mexico, or let's say pasta has in Italy. It is one with the country of Ethiopia. Everyone has Burberry at, at the house, right? So Burberry is like smoked dried chilies with dried garlic, ginger. So this spice plant that has about seven or eight ingredients, and they sun dry, then you take them in, mm-hmm. and then you blend them and sift them and sell it on the market. And it's everywhere. So it, it's not spicy like cayenne. Right. It's more like a smoked paprika in, in terms of flavor. It's subtler. It is subtler, and you can use lots of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, with, with cayenne, you just kind of finish because it's very spicy. Right. This gives this kind of like, you know, it's not taking over the dish. It's mm-hmm. kind of like a hint. Like Aleppo pepper, for example, mm-hmm. right? It has that a flavor. Do... do does does Barbary uh, uh, differ from place to place? Like, do people do mm-hmm. their own version of it? Yes, and that's why I said it's about seven to eight ingredients. Because when I say this is truly terroir, that's like so. In certain part of Ethiopia, it doesn't rain. Certain part, it does rain. So the sun drying changes. Sometimes you're up in the mountains of three thousand feet, so it changes the flavor completely. Oh, wow. So yeah, it's really this sort of. Depths in flavor in terms of spice plant. And I love it. I, I just, it's part of, you're not Ethiopian if you're not eating Burberry. <laughs> that's, that's simple as that. I'm taking the card. Oh, there you go. Hey, podcast fans. Ready to unlock our true crime mysteries? Try Dateline Premium on Apple Podcasts. You'll get early access to originals, plus bonus content. And everything is ad-free. So head to Apple Podcasts now to subscribe. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Hey, podcast fans, ready to unlock our true crime mysteries? Try Dateline Premium on Apple Podcasts. You'll get early access to originals, plus bonus content, and everything is ad-free. So head to Apple Podcasts now to subscribe. Hey, I'm Hallie. It's good to be with you tonight. There's another legal filing today, and I want to cut through some of the weedsy stuff. But let's just, like, get to the point. They have started to vote on the PACT. Act. If you're like, Kelly, stop speaking Washingtonese. This bill would basically give health care to veterans who have exposed to these toxic chemicals. Just got, I'm trying to make this as not D.C. as possible. The increased sort of anger that we've seen now in politics. I saw you searching for, I think, your microphone, Danny. You are, oh, I was you trying to do it on the slide. Live TV, man. It's okay. Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. You get one beautiful so life to live. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold. We have this circle of women that love each other. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Love you. Yeah. Love you too. <laughs> Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. So here's the thing. You know, we're, we are a nation of immigrants. Yes. And, and all come together. And what brings us together on any given year is Thanksgiving. And, and I've always yes. been fascinated by by your story because it is truly uh this this marvelous story that happens in in several in two different continents ending up here tell for folks who don't know mm-hmm. g- give us your background well um i've been extremely lucky and blessed and fortunate to have loving parents right and that wasn't you know me and my sister we were born in ethiopia and my sister, my birth mother, and I, we had tuberculosis. So sometimes the worst thing that can happen to you can also be a blessing. My mom walked us into the hospital in, in, in Addis, and then eventually she passed away. And here's where luck and goodness of others comes in, right? Me and my sister got cured from TB after three months with two kids, two years old and five years old, nowhere to go. The nurse takes us into her house. She's like, nope. They, otherwise, they're just going to get kicked out on the street. She takes us in, connects us with a Swedish adoption agency. That takes another three months. And, you know, I go from being Kasahunsi guy to Marcus Samuelson. Eight hours later, I'm on a plane, go to Stockholm, from Stockholm to Gothenburg. And I'm Marcus Samuelson, met my new parents, and they raised me. And I've been extremely fortunate to have them in my life. When I first met you, you were working at a restaurant, Aquavit. Yes. And you were talking about, and we met, and you were talking about your you know, Swedish meatballs. Mm-hmm. And I mean, am I, am I missing something here? <laughs> I, I, this is your home dish? Wait, I'm, I'm confused. Yeah. So, so and what I, I think has always been fascinating is that you have embraced 
all sides mm -hmm. of your upbringing and yes. your heritage and your cultures. Uh, and, and so I would think you have a, a, a very unique appreciation of Thanksgiving. I love Thanksgiving and I love that we come together as one to eat and celebrate. America has a rocky history like every country, but this is here is a week or a couple of days where, you know, no, we're not Republican, we're not Democrats, we're not Southerners, we're, not, we're Americans, and we're going to celebrate this day. Mm -hmm. And our past wasn't linear, our past was very complicated, but we're going to celebrate it around food. And we think about what we've all been through, through, still going through, through the pandemic, yeah. right? It's a privilege to sit down with your family and extended family. It's a moment taking a brief, so like, pause, and like, hey, I appreciate you. Yeah. And it was maybe something pre-pandemic that we took for granted. And, you know, last year taught me that. I will never take it for granted again. And I appreciate my family. I love my family, of course, but my extended family, just like you work with a big tribe mm -hmm. at the show, they become family. Yeah. My restaurant family is also part of my family. How, how difficult was this during the pandemic for that? Because you were able to keep things open and to keep mm. things going, you know, where... And, and and more has grown out of that yeah. uh, that experience. You know, I'm going to be very honest with you. Um, I started with fear. What's going to happen? And as a chef, part of it that you know everything that happens in your restaurant. You are the tribe leader. People sign up to work for you. Customers sign up. And so there's a certain level of, you got to go through this. I didn't have a clue how. I didn't have a clue. But I had a community. And I called Jose Andres. And he said, World Central Kitchen will be there. Two days later, when we had to close Red Rooster, World Central Kitchen was there. They were there early and said, we have masks, we have gloves, and we know how to serve with social, through social distance safety as well. Mm -hmm. We started to serve 300 people again, first responder, homeless people, community. Eventually, we started 500 people, then 1,500 people a day. And it transformed my life. I needed, just as much as we served, I also needed that security. Like, I got to get up in the morning, go over to work, make sure everything is okay. Because I worked with food and restaurants since I was 18 years old. I don't know anything else. And I was so afraid that this thing that I built and hundreds of people work with me is going to be taken away. And I don't know myself as an adult without it. It truly raised me. You know, restaurant, food, mm -hmm. people truly yeah. raised me. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight and expert analysis. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Hey, I'm Hallie. It's good to be with you tonight. There's another legal filing today, and I want to cut through some of the weedsy stuff. But let's just, like, get to the point. They have started to vote on the PACT. Act. If you're like, Hallie, stop speaking Washingtonese. This bill would basically give health care to veterans who have exposed to these toxic chemicals. Scott, I'm trying to make this as not D.C. as possible. The increased sort of anger that we've seen now in politics. I saw you searching for, I think, your microphone, Danny. You are out. I was you trying got it. to do it on the slide. Live TV, man. It's okay. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Hey, I'm Hallie. It's good to be with you tonight. There's another legal filing today, and I want to cut through some of the weedsy stuff. But let's just, like, get to the point. They have started to vote on the PACT Act. If you're like, Hallie, stop speaking Washingtonese. This bill would basically give health care to veterans who have exposed to these toxic chemicals. Just got, I'm trying to make this as not D.C. as possible. The increased sort of anger that we've seen now in politics. I saw you searching for, I think, your microphone, Danny. You are out. I was you trying to do it on the slide. Live TV, man. It's okay. And good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. This Thanksgiving, as we mm. uh, come together, and, and hopefully more and more people can do that, mm. um, 
how is this Thanksgiving different for you than, say, ones in the past? It's totally different because I think that you start seeing, like, it's mixed baggage of news constantly, right? Mm -hmm. We're out of it. We're done. It's coming back. So you, you go in this back and forth state and it you just want, we all just want to put this behind us, right? Mm -hmm. No, there is not two sides of what, where we want to go, yeah. but this humbles us and we have to be restricted a little bit. And we're not used to that, especially as Americans, right? So it's a huge challenge for us. And I think about it as, the restaurant, it might be open, it might not, because we don't know what's going to happen. Things that I totally took for granted before, mm -hmm. I just had to learn to take a minute and say, you know, let's see what's going to happen. No matter what, I'm going to be supportive of my team, mm -hmm. and um, I'm going to invite in neighbors. We do that last year. We did it on our block, but through FaceTime. Yeah. So we're going to do a version of that, whether we meet in the middle of the block or some come in, I don't know. But we're going to be a community, both in my home in Harlem, but also in my restaurant. So, Marcus, what are, what are some of your first memories of Thanksgiving? I have many early fun memories of Thanksgiving because when I came to this country, I worked in a Swedish restaurant, Aquavit, and we were closed during Thanksgiving. And it was one of these things that a lot of cooks, you know, they don't come from New York City. So it's like, okay, I had an apartment with less roommates than they had, right? <laughs> a little bit more space. So I'm like, all right, let's host it. So we, we cooked up the storm and since people come from all over the world to work in New York City, right? So we had Indian curry on one table. We had, I, I had the herring and the groblax from Thanksgiving. <laughs> the turkey was in the room, <laughs> but it was way over there. And it was just so much fun to see the, 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 the team outside the restaurant mm -hmm. and we told stories. And it was just one of my favorite days actually to celebrate. It probably is really the true meaning of Thanksgiving. Yep. yep. That's fine. Is Red Rooster going to be open for Thanksgiving? Definitely be open, both in Miami and in, in Harlem. Absolutely. Tell me about you, this. In Miami, you've got, you're in a, a really historical uh, yes. neighborhood. It's not one that when people think about when they think about Miami. You know, when we had opportunity to expand Red Rooster to Miami, I said it, it needs to be in a predominantly historical African-American neighborhood why not the beach? Why not the Brickle? Well, I love all these places, but no, I wanted to do something that makes sense for us. So um, Overtown was called, used to be called the Harlem of the South. And when I started reading this history, that's where Muhammad Ali stayed. That's where Miles Stavis stayed. That's where Sam Cooke did one of his best albums. And so when I found this property and learned the history about it, I said, we have to renovate it. This is where we're going to put Red Rooster. It's right in front of Lyric Theater, which is like kind of like the Apollo mm -hmm. at, in Miami. And it's a beautiful restaurant. And we built it and opened it during COVID. It was a lot of start and stops. Mm -hmm. Like we were ready and then we had to close. <laughs> and then we were, you know, but it's because the weather is, you know, different there. Uh, basically, the whole restaurant is basically on the patio. Oh. So people sit outside. That, it, perfect, perfect for COVID. Yeah. <laughs> uh, or any time yeah. at, at that. So you know, you've got your your son is five. You know, mm -hmm. you've, you've had a few Thanksgivings now as a as a family. Mm -hmm. Is there a family tradition of Thanksgiving that you you guys do year after year? We cook a lot, and then we have a couple of people that we give out the food to in our neighborhood that uh, are home insecure. And we mm -hmm. also have a tradition of donating toys because we got too many. <laughs> During the, this, this time, it started up a Black Business Matters yeah. matching fund. Tell me about that. You know, you and I have both been extremely fortunate to do what we love and ha have a career on it, but we're not the majority of people that look like us. And we know that 41% of all Black and Brown businesses in all fields closed during COVID, and they're not coming back. So the access, for me, it's what's really important. Like, who can, what can we do, right? What can my team do? Who can I partner with? So it was important to start a fund where we can not give out loans mm -hmm. to small businesses because they don't need more loans. Yeah. It was really grants. And we give out um, grants to small businesses across the country. And I don't even like the term small business because for that family, it's their <laughs> only business. Yeah. Exactly. So we gave out grants across the country uh, to black and brown businesses. And Alice, I travel, I started to travel again. Every now and then, like some guy or some lady runs after me and say, hey, 
I just want to say thank you. We got $8,000 from you. I said, you didn't get it from me. You earned it way before. We were able to help 200 businesses across the country and giving them that break, that $18,000, that $8,000, that $3,000. And it was carried them through to the next break. And that's what we need. I'm a guy that got lucky breaks and um, on many levels, both in my personal life, but also obviously in my uh, business life. And anytime I can do that and extend that, one of the things that I take the most joy from actually. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight and expert analysis. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. You get one beautiful life to live. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold. We have this circle of women that love each other. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Love you. Yeah. Love you too. <laughs> Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight and expert analysis. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. You get one beautiful life to live. What are you going to do? This show is so fun, but having you as a positive force means really the world. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold, okay? We have this circle of women that love each other. I decided I'm going to go with the rhythm of life. And you love riding the I love riding. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Love you. Yeah. I love you too. I love my grandmother, uh -huh. but the way she cooked Brussels was no good. Wait. All right, so so I love this idea of that we got to get the sound strike. So we're going to... Mm -hmm. Did you hear that? Oh, I heard that. It's yeah. Garlic. Garlic time. Boom. And these Brussels are great because you just take the bottom off a little bit like this, mm -hmm. and then you take off the, the, those leaves back here. And what's great about this is that you can do this with a family. Oh, you know, because you cook yes, with your kids. I do. My boy Nick and I during the pandemic, yep. that's all we were doing. You know, one of the other things I've discovered quite by accident with the Brussels sprouts leaves, I kind of wash them off, and I'll sometimes just roast it a little olive oil and just roast those. They are so Make Brussels sprout chips. Exactly. Now you're stripping down some rosemary. Mm -hmm. And I'm just going to chop it up. Mm -hmm. Now you sliced up some of the garlic. Yes. And you could you could add or subtract as you, as you like. I like a lot of garlic. Yes, you know. absolutely. I'm just going to throw in a little bit of salt. And, and you know this, Albert. Mm -hmm. The whole thing with salt is make sure your hands are not are dry, not wet. Mm -hmm. And go start here. Start right? high? Start high. And then come and down? Go down. Okay. And then just make sure because the salt is really like the, the thing that can make something from good to great. This is not salt. This now, goes from my home country. This is like the clothes that you buy. This is the expensive Burberry clothes that you've got. Buy. Yes, the Burberry. So, yeah, this yeah. is Burberry from Ethiopia. Ah, this mm. is so oh, I delicious. I love the smell of that. Right? That's crazy. When man. you smell this, and when you get to Ethiopia, this ah. is sort of what everyone has in the household. Okay? So we're gonna toss this mm -hmm. with a little bit of olive oil and put it on a sheet tray. Look at that. Oh, I love the sound of that. Right. So you you just and just on the, the on some parchment paper on yes. the, on a on a cookie sheet mm -hmm. and a baking sheet and into the oven for, for how long? So we cooked it about fifteen minutes or so uh -huh. and around four to four fifty, pretty okay. high heat. So it'll get a little brown, a little crispy. Yes, yes. And while that's cooking, you're gonna make a nice uh, a, a kind of a shallot vinaigrette. Yeah, we're gonna give some crunch to it. Do you know what I mean? So peanuts, ground up mm. peanuts, so delicious. Right, gives you that salted. Crunch. Uh, these are unsalted. Unsalted. And uh, it could be sunflower seeds, it could be peanuts, it could be Oh, so you seeds. can do whatever nut yeah, you want. just that crunch, mm -hmm. right? And then cook them up and just caramelize them a little bit. Mm -hmm. And this, this Brussels salad really is mm -hmm. really all about texture, right? And flavors because because of the peanuts and because of the things that we're adding in, it's going to be so crunchy and delicious. Absolutely. Now, what kind of oil are you? Uh, just some olive oil. Just some olive oil? Just some olive oil. Okay. I didn't know it would be like peanut oil. Would that be too much? Would that be too much peanut? No, I think the peanut oil definitely makes sense. But when you cook, especially on the holiday, you don't want to have two oils. Yeah, you get all the oil. Who needs all the oil? Yeah. Hey, come on. Yeah, exactly. Stop it. So just the shallows, we just cut them down mm -hmm. and just 
just like that. People are afraid of shallots because it is. Uh, well, I think because they got to peel them and it's, uh, what? they're all upset. People what? get worked up when you say that's shallots. what people are saying. Well, I don't know if they are. That's what I was saying. <laughs> I'm gonna hear. I'm sure we're gonna hear from, yeah. the, the, from the shallot lobby. What are you talking about? You're talking oh. trash talk about our yeah, shallots. Yeah, exactly. Just like uh, Michelle Obama, when they go low, we go high. Oh. Boom! <laughs> gonna be right. And I'm just gonna bring a little bit of chopped parsley as well. Mm -hmm. There's nothing like just that bitter, beautiful piece of, of parsley. I love it. You know, when I was a child, I didn't like it. Yeah, but I but now love it. You've come to appreciate it. Yes. It means the two things. It means that I'm old and you change your taste. There right? you go. But the reason why you want a little bitter here mm -hmm. is because we're gonna add sweet things to this. So ah. I'm gonna have maple syrup mm -hmm. and we're oh. gonna have these guys. Those uh, guys. Uh, the, the pomegranate The cheese? pomegranate, exactly. So the sweetness is gonna go up. Mm. I love this sound. I love it. Shh, shh, shh. So. A little there. more olive. Yeah, just a little bit of flavors. Look at that. This alone wow. is delicious, right? I was going to say. And I'm going back with the same flavors. Mm -hmm. Some rosemary. Uh -huh. A little bit of maple syrup. It could be wow. honey. Put in agave if you wanted. Could be agave. agave. See, you travel. You fancy. I've been around. You know, I'm here. I've been to, to a promote, rodeo. I've seen the county upstate, fair. Upstate, I'm trying to promote upstate, local ingredients. That's you right. Go that upstate. Go upstate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Upstate yeah. that maple, that New York yeah. maple syrup. Yeah, exactly. Oh, that smells fantastic. Smells so good, right? And the sound. Mmm. <laughs> so this, this is it. This is it. Look at this. Wow. This is it. This is the noisiest recipe we've made yet. Yeah. It's fantastic. So, look at that. Oh, that golden color. Oh, and now look at this. Add in. Now you've got the, the, the Brussels sprouts that we've already taken out of the oven. You've already yes. prepped these. And you're gonna put it in here. Yeah, we're gonna toss them because that's, now they're gonna get coated with this beautiful. This is next level. It is, but it's your holidays. You want that. I like how your voice went up. You got family from Paris coming. Oh. You better have some good Brussels on the this. table. Look at this. Look at that. Oh That's my it. Gosh. Look at this. Look at this. This is what I mean. This wow. is a dish by itself. And, you know, it's crunchy. Get in there. Get in there. This, I mean, this looks like the holidays. It does, right? It really does. I mean, it'd be perfect for Christmas. It almost look, it looks Christmassy. It looks you, it looks bountyish. All the through the whole winter, you can use, you you can use this recipe, you know. And it's just so this is almost delicious. like a meal. This is a meal unto itself. It is definitely. And you have the crunch. You have the delicious factor, and you have you know the craveability. I can almost I can I can I can feel the umami. Yes. I can feel I the love umami. It, Al. Before you I even, now before, I, before uh, I even eat this, yes. I can Fancy. here. Let me well, look at us. Hold on. Let me. Here, you hold I, that I one. I can feel the umami. I That's can feel. Fancy. Can you feel umami tonight? Nice. Here we go. Look at that. Yeah. Oh. Mmm. And the crunch from the pomegranate and the peanut. So delicious. This mm. is. Crazy good. Mm. I got a lot to be thankful for this thing. <laughs> That's something new for the dish. Thank you. Oh! Whatever you guys are doing here, mm -hmm. this is fun. This is next level. Oh. As we um, wrap up, and I still have the those Brussels sprouts. Oh my <laughs> gosh, they're so fantastic. What, what are you most thankful for this year? The fact that I'm most thankful for that my family and I, and my extended family and I, are healthy. We lost people in 20. I lost my uncle. My nephew had long COVID in Sweden, like not just for months, but for a very, very long time. Was, you know, he's 26, and it's like it was, it was, it was very, very scary for us. And, um, you know, I lost my friend, which you know very well as well, Mr. Floyd Cardos. So 20 was a year where we... It was really shaky for us emotionally, for me and my family. And um, I'm grateful for that we are healthy and that we are able to do this uh, and move forward. And uh, again, there is a lesson in all of this, right? It might be too early to really see it, mm -hmm. but there is a lesson. I think moments like Thanksgiving, 
gives us an opportunity to say, hey, I appreciate you. I love you. Well, Marcus Samuelson, I appreciate you. I have appreciated your friendship, mm. your hospitality, and your kindness. Uh, you are truly uh, one of the best. And I'm so thrilled that we were able to have you on Cooking Up a Storm with Al Roker. All the best and enjoy the holidays. Same to you and your family. And Al, I just want to say, I mean, we don't, you, just can, you can take it out, you can keep it in, but I just want to say uh, you're truly a mentor for me and your journey is so inspirational. And when I would think about longevity and greatness, your name always comes up first. So I think for everything, just setting the standard. Thank you so much. No, thank you, my friend. Thank you. Grab your apron for a new podcast, Cooking Up a Storm with Al Roker. I forecast, yummy. Some of the best chefs spill the beans on family secrets to get you ready for Thanksgiving. Didn't fun. Bringing the heat for the holidays. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts. Oh, cranberry sauce. The eternal question, canned or homemade? Probably one of the biggest debates of the Thanksgiving meal. And while for some, this dish might be the last thing you really even think about when you're prepping your Thanksgiving meal, our next chef has a recipe so enticing that it just may convince you to serve cranberries as your main course. His name, Sean Sherman, a James Beard award-winning chef, also a member of the Oglala Lakota tribe, Raised in Pine Ridge, South Dakota, currently living in Minneapolis, Minnesota, Chef Sean is committed to showing people some of the incredible dishes that can be made with foods indigenous to this continent. Today, he's going to take us through one of his favorite recipes, Lojape, a traditional sauce made out of berries. Now, while a lot of different kinds of berries can be used in this dish today, we're going to use cranberry and rosehip. It's a recipe that's sure to not only change the way we consider cranberries, but teach us something as well. Sean, thanks so much for joining us today on Cooking Up a Storm. Thanks for having me. Really appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, here's the thing. This dish is, is not only gorgeous, but it is delicious as well. And, and it seems to me that it would be a very versatile uh, kind of recipe in that you can pair this with different things. Uh, today, we've got this wonderful cornbread-like uh, meal, uh, but what, what are some of the other pairings that this could go with? Well, I mean, it's just a sauce, so I feel like there's no rules. You can do whatever you want to with it. Mm -hmm. You can use it for leftovers the next day. You can make a salad dressing with it. You can uh, freeze it and make a sorbet. You can do all those things. This is something you grew up with. Your grandmother uh, would, would make this, uh, wojape, which it's a Lakota word. Uh, but using a different berry, uh, what would she? How would she make it? What berries would she use? Well, we traditionally use choke cherries because the choke cherry trees grew all over the plains around the Badlands and Black Hills in South Dakota. So we harvested a ton of choke cherries, and then they would just cook it down with water and sweeten it if it needs to be sweetened a little bit. But for me, that aroma just sends me right back to being five years old. You've got uh, this terrific restaurant in, uh, in in Minneapolis. What berries do you use for your wojape in that restaurant? At our restaurant called Awamni by the Sioux Chef, spelled S-I-O-U-X, <laughs> <laughs> Um, we use all sorts of berries. We've been using aronia berries, choke cherries, cranberries, blackberries, mm -hmm. blueberries, um, you know, both wild and domesticated. But we also utilize a lot of wild foods out there too. Lots of conifers and trees, lots of wild herbs like hyssop and bergamot. And there's so much to explore when you start looking around the world and seeing all these plants with all these great tastes and flavors. I feel like the Western diets never really touched like the amazing flavors of where we are here. Is this in a sense a seasonal dish in that using different berries that are uh, native and are in season at different times. Absolutely. I feel like this is a perfect time, you know, into the fall season because cranberries come out around that time, September, mm -hmm. October, and the rose hips are best when they're drying up and the leaves are turning color and they get a little bit sweeter. So that's a good time to harvest them in the wild if you know what to look for. Um, so I feel like it's a very fall recipe. This food and the food you prep is that it, in a sense, it's what would have been foraged. 
Yeah, we just try to make food taste like where we might be. So in I'm in Minneapolis around the Great Lakes where there's lots of woods and lakes. And, you know, I could if I find a cranberry bog, um, there'll be some rose hips along the lake shore and there'll be maple trees around there, too. So all those ingredients are living together right there. And it's fun to think about that, mm-hmm. of, you know, what were indigenous peoples utilizing for food and what was in their pantries and what were the flavors that they were playing with to create all sorts of recipes. <laughs> Hey, I'm Hallie. It's good to be with you tonight. There's another legal filing today, and I want to cut through some of the weedsy stuff. But let's just, like, get to the point. They have started to vote on the PACT Act. If you're like, Hallie, stop speaking Washingtonese. This bill would basically give health care to veterans who have exposed to these toxic chemicals. Just got, I'm trying to make this as not D.C. as possible. The increased sort of anger that we've seen now in politics. I saw you searching for, I think, your microphone, Danny. You are out. I was you trying to it. do it on the slide. Live TV, man. It's okay. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. our true crime mysteries try dateline premium on apple podcasts you'll get early access to originals plus bonus content and everything is ad free so head to apple podcast now to subscribe sean what what are rose hips i I just uh, all i can think of is like a flower that looks like Elvis singing, but I'm sure it has nothing to do with that. What what are rose hips? So if you know what a rose plant looks like, right. um, you'll find these little red kind of uh, blossom pieces on there. And as they dry up, they get really sweet and tart, and it's a wonderful flavor. So I harvest a lot of wild foods in the forests and on the Great Plains, because that's kind of the area that I live in. And there's rose hips all over the place, and they're really fun to harvest. And you know, there's thorns, so you have to be a little bit careful. <laughs> <laughs> picking them. Um, and there's a lot of seeds in them, so they take a little bit of work. Um, but there's uh, plenty of places to find dried rose hips that are uh, seeded and sifted and mm-hmm. easy to use. And you can literally just pour some hot water out over those and it'll turn into a, a rose hip jam within moments. So that's a, it's a wonderful little piece. And if you don't have rose hips, what would you substitute that? You can use whatever you want to. I mean, like I said, when I grew up, wojapi was choke cherry, but we use lots of mixed berries. So you can do cranberry and blueberry. You can do cranberry and blackberry, cranberry and strawberry, like whatever makes you happy. So, uh, Sean, is there a particular dish that uh, goes with wojapi? Well, when I was growing up, it was fry bread, which actually has a lot of uh, interesting history, too, (laughs) when it comes from colonized foods. Um, But, uh, you know, I just love it with vegetables. I love it with this cornbread that we're serving with it today. And I think it's pretty much good on whatever you want to. We would just eat it straight when I was a kid. So It seems like Awamni would be, in a sense, of the moment right now, in that uh, a plant-based diet has never been probably more popular and gaining more acceptance. Uh, is, is that, was that just a happy accident for you guys? You know, we celebrate a lot of plant-based foods. Um, I myself um, eat largely a plant-based diet, and it was easy for us to celebrate plants um, because we cut out dairy, and so there's no cheese and all that stuff in our food. So if it didn't have meat on it particularly, then it was completely plant-based. So over half the menu ended up being plant-based like that. And, you know, it's good because you eat that food and you feel healthy. It mm-hmm. uh, agrees with your stomach and your body, and it makes your mind happy. Yeah, what are some of the goals of your, your new restaurant, Awamni, in, in Minneapolis? It's really to showcase that a modern indigenous restaurant can exist in this world. I feel like we should have indigenous restaurants in every single city because we're in these food capitals like Manhattan, like Chicago, like, uh, you know, and there's zero Native American restaurants, which is insane because no matter where we are, we're standing on indigenous land and we should be, there should be healthy and happy representation of indigenous cultures and showcasing that diversity and celebrating that diversity through food and through story. We're talking about this dish for uh, Thanksgiving, which, you know, for the indigenous peoples of our country, it's got to be a complicated holiday. 
It absolutely is. I mean, because if you look at the the Pilgrim and the Indian story, you know, there's a lot of erasure going on. It's kind of like, remember that time we had you over for dinner a few hundred years ago? You know, <laughs> it doesn't talk about all of the uh, really intense trauma that happened to indigenous peoples, especially in the 17 and 1800s and even, you know, through the 1900s. And so there's a lot of repair work to do. Um, and we shouldn't be celebrating those stories that uh, really have no basis in reality. Uh, but we can be celebrating holidays to come together as people and as families and to celebrate food and why not celebrate the food of the land you're standing on for you growing up what was your relationship i mean i try to imagine what it would be like because again having grown up in this country uh but you know again uh, you know as as a black american having you know a complicated relationship um but for you a, a holiday one of our central holidays in this country um, based on, in, in a sense, this this mythology that wasn't correct, were you aware of that? Does it did it make it a difficult time for you to celebrate growing up? You know, it's, it's just complicated, like you said. So some some family really embraced it and really loved the the whole dinner, the whole classical dinner, and others were really upset about the whole story for obvious reasons. And so I have lots of family members that won't celebrate Thanksgiving particularly because of that. But I feel like we can grow out of that. I feel like we can move forward with it. I feel like that particular holiday doesn't have to carry that mythology with it. Mm -hmm. And we don't have to single out an entire culture with an untrue story. So here we are, 2021. Uh, what role do you think Thanksgiving plays today or should it play? It should really be a celebration of harvest. It should be a celebration of coming together. It should be a celebration of being thankful and looking forward and just, you know, being with people that we love and uh, missing the people that can't be there with us. A number of folks uh, that we've talked to on this podcast have talked about that, 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 that Thanksgiving for them tends to be their favorite holiday because at its core, especially today, it's more about not so much what happened in the past, but what's happening now and why we are thankful. And, and it doesn't have a religious connotation. It is not about gift giving. It is just about celebrating what you, what you are thankful for. That's what it should be for, you know, and it shouldn't have this kind of nationalistic kind of uh, touch to it, you know, of celebrating, um, again, uh, this this pilgrims and Indians coming together situation where everything's good because it's not that simple. Like there's a lot of things that we should address in our society of how this country was built and things that we need to do better to move forward. Mm -hmm. um, and again, just it's celebrating more diversity, inclusivity, um, I think is going to be more important. And learning about a food's history or, or the importance that an indigenous food uh, played in this country and continues to play. Does that does that food history uh, bring us or can it bring us closer together? I feel like it can because I feel like if people truly understand how countless communities were surviving for thousands of generations before anybody else showed up on this land space and all the amazing diversity of food and flavor that was out there, there's so much to learn. You know, when you look at some of these bases, like the, the corn, the wild rice, the cranberry, the maple, the rose hips, all those are from these regions, you know, and there's so much history behind there and there's so much connection to indigenous peoples with these foods and we should be learning about those stories. It'll help open us up. Mm -hmm. For you, um, what are you thankful for this year? <laughs> I'm thankful for everything that we're able to do. I'm thankful for the work that we have, for the team that's behind us. I'm thankful for uh, being around all this wonderful food. I'm thankful for all these opportunities to tell these stories. And I, I will tell you, uh, I think what is unique about Wojape that I don't think any other uh, dish that we've prepared during this podcast, I, I think that is the one thing that literally can be from start to fish in a meal. It could be in an appetizer. It could be part of an entree. could be a dessert. I mean, this is probably the Swiss army knife <laughs> of Thanksgiving food. It's extremely versatile, of course. Yeah, and again, like there's no rules. You can do whatever you want to with it. I like that for Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving, no rules. Wojape. You get one beautiful life to live. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold. We have this circle of women that love each other. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Love ya. Love you too. <laughs> you get one beautiful life to live. What are you gonna do? This show is so fun, but having you as a positive force means really the world to me. 
Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold, okay? We have this circle of women that love each other. I decided I'm gonna go with the rhythm of life. And you love riding the I way. Love riding. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you too. Good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. You get one beautiful life to live. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold. We have this circle of women that love each other. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Love you. Yeah. <laughs> the day's biggest political stories with trusted insight and expert analysis. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Thank so you. thrilled to have you. I, and, you know, look, I don't think people realize uh, what a real food town uh, Minneapolis is. Mm -hmm. And and you found this this place with your, your uh, restaurant, Alumni. Tell me about it. Well, we are right on the Mississippi River, and we're right on a really sacred Dakota space because there used to be this beautiful waterfall right in that area, right downtown Minneapolis, and it was called Awamni Yamni by the Dakota people. And we took the short name Awamni to celebrate this beautiful place to showcase what is modern indigenous food um, and really kind of utilizing a lot of wild foods around us and making food taste like where we are. And Sean, I, th I think what we're making today is basically central to your restaurant. You don't use uh, what you call colonized ingredients. Explain that. Well, we cut out ingredients that weren't from here, so we removed things like dairy, wheat flour, cane sugar, beef, pork, chicken, things that were introduced to these lands. And we really focus on what were the foods of where we were or where we are. Um, so we utilize a lot of wild foods, a lot of native agriculture products like corns, beans, squash, maple, pieces like that. And just again, like try to make food taste like where we are and put a lot of representation into the indigenous cultures of that region. Which I think is, is really important coming up for Thanksgiving. Uh, what are we making? This is kind of a cranberry sauce, but a different take. What is? What are you making? It's just really simple because we're just utilizing cranberries, we're utilizing rose hips, and we're mm -hmm. utilizing maple, and all three of those things live together. So you can find a cranberry bog in the you know in the Great Lakes regions, and you can look around and find wild roses and find maple trees, and all those ingredients live together right there. And, and the dish is called. Well, Wojapi is what Wo we call it. Traditionally for us, we mm -hmm. utilize choke cherry uh, as a berry sauce for that piece. How do we start this? All right, well, all we're going to do basically is just put everything in a pot mm -hmm. <laughs> and let it go. Wow, this <laughs> is going to be a tough one. It's a pretty simple recipe. Um, and all of these, uh, both the rose hips and the and cranberries have so much natural pectin that just thickens up so nicely. Now, in rose hips, where do you get rose hips? Uh, well, you can find rose hips online. You can find them at some uh, health food stores. Uh -huh. um, but we harvest a lot of them wild because they're all around the lakes. They're all around the forest. Um, they're all around the plains. Um, they're, they're, you know, it's just, it's good. We try to entice people to learn about the plants of their regions. Mm -hmm. And there's so much food and medicine and stuff that we can be doing with this. And some natural sweeteners really go really well with this stuff. And some maple syrup. And it's the simplest recipe in the world because it's just, everybody has cranberries on their Thanksgiving table. Mm -hmm. right? And this is just looking at it through a different lens. Um, we even put things like uh, cedar or pine or something to give it a little flavor of the oh, forest of where we are, yeah. Uh, so, so you're using frozen cranberries, but you could, you, could you use fresh? Oh, absolutely, because fresh cranberry season is great when it's here, and we utilize a lot of them, but the frozen cranberries, non-sugared, are so good, you know. Wow, you know, you know it's funny you used to talk about cedar. And I, I had made a recipe this past holiday season that called for a, uh, a, a pine simple syrup, and I never thought that, you know, uh, you just clean off the Christmas tree <laughs> and, and you boil it with sugar and water and you end up with a, a wonderful aromatic syrup. 
Absolutely, like we serve a lot of wild teas, like uh, white cedar tea, sumac tea, pine tea, spruce tea, balsam fir tea, um, and those flavors are really wonderful and they're all around us, mm -hmm. you know, especially where I'm at in Minnesota where there's uh, so much forest and lakes there. Now, how long will you cook this down for? You only need to cook this for about 15 minutes, really, mm -hmm. and uh, it comes, you know, you can kind of cook it to where you feel like the consistency is gonna be where you want it to be. So we've got some over here that's, that's already been simmering. How do you, do, do you want a a, a smooth consistency and if so how do you how do you have to make that happen? I feel like it's really a matter of preference because these things will break up so easily on their own and you can break them up with just a whisk mm -hmm. um, but if you happen to have um, an immersion blender and you want a really smooth sauce ah. then you're able to just buzz this up really quickly and carefully and you have, want to be really careful of course because it's hot liquid and you don't want to uh, spray everywhere so, yeah, that's right. yeah you know I'm looking at this and you, you know it would almost seem like if you had leftovers, you could freeze this and almost make a sorbet. Absolutely, yep, in the same, same situation, because it's just the simplest of sauces. You can put it on sandwiches, you can you know, put it on, use it as a salad dressing once uh, it's cold. Oh, wow. You can do all sorts of stuff. And you can smell a little bit of that rose uh -huh. hip and the cranberry that kind of sets it aside. Oh, yeah. How did you come up with this? <laughs> Well, it was just the simplest of ingredients. So cra basic cranberry sauce is just that, cooking some cranberries in some water. Adding the rose hips, I think, adds a little bit more thickness and sheen to it and mm. a little uh, floralness. Uh um, you're just using a natural sweetener like maple or maybe agave or something like that. Just really kind of brings it out. So it doesn't need to be a big sugary sauce, you mm -hmm. know, because the, the fruit itself has a lot of flavor. And then w what are we serving this with? So we make these little husk breads um, at our restaurant. And it's just really simple because it's literally just uh, dried corn that's uh, cooked and then ground into a, a corn dough. And we're actually using some of this puffed wild rice. So we just take mm. wild rice, because where we are in Minnesota, we have true wild rice growing around all the lakes. There's mm -hmm. like, you know, 15,000 lakes in Minnesota. And there's so much of this. And we just dry toast it, and it just makes a nice little snack. Oh, this is toast. So you eat it just Yeah, like you can eat it just like that. Oh, that's crunchy. Yeah, it's good. It's good. And then so this stuff, you just add a little bit of sauce. Mm -hmm. So, so these little corn packets have uh, wild rice, a little bit of fresh corn, dried corn, and it's just so simple. And again, you know, because of what we do, we're gluten-free, dairy-free, sugar-free, soy-free, pork-free, you name it, so. <laughs> <laughs> and it's healthy, and it tastes good. Yeah. That's great, I mean, it's almost like a it looks like a jam jelly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, super simple. Super, super simple. Better than the canned stuff. I was going to say, is, is, is food the great uniter? It really is, because we all have food in common, and you know, cultural food is something that's really important. It's our identity. You know, we think about our parents and our grandparents and the foods that they pass down. And you know, I want to see a world where we can find indigenous restaurants all over the nation celebrating the history and the land of where that might be. Well, this is terrific. This is something to give thanks for. Awesome. This is wonderful. Sean, thank, thank you, you so, so much. much. Yeah. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Love you. Yeah. Love you too. <laughs> Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now.
we're going to start with you and the yes. Roker family. What's the, the history with the sweet potato? Well, my mother has always always made this, and, uh, you know, uh, and it, it, we still make it kind of in her memory. Yeah. And you can use any sweet potatoes, sweet potatoes, yams. You've got white sweet potatoes, uh, Japanese. Any number of them all have a little bit of a different flavor. But you basically peel them down, and then you cut them up uh, into, like, about two-inch size cubes. Now, I've, I have done a little uh, a variation of this where I cut them up into slightly smaller cubes and then actually roasted them, and it gives it a slightly nuttier flavor. But you're basically like going to put these in, boil them for about 10, 12 minutes till they get nice and soft. And then once that happens, uh, you like let them cream. cool off. And you've got uh, a little butter. Mm -hmm. Just a little. Just a little butter. Just a little <laughs> butter. You've got some flour. Mm -hmm. uh, you've got some brown sugar. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is healthy. This that is, is good. Yeah, there's Diet nothing food. good about this. Okay. Uh, you've got uh, pineapple. Uh, pi crushed oh. pineapple. Pineapple. And then what are the spices? That's, it. That's the secret. Yeah, pineapple. Like pineapple. And then you've got nutmeg, brown, uh, uh, some cloves, some uh, salt, and uh, some cinnamon. You put it all in. You mash it up till it's in a rough. You don't want it smooth. You just mash it yeah. so that it's kind of rough. So you, you don't even use the electric mixer. You no, just, use just mash your uh, just a nice work. Out. Did you guys have this only the holidays? Or yeah, this? my mother would only make it uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas. Oh, cool. Then you bake it for about 30 minutes at 350, and then you line it with marshmallows. And you mm. line that up. You put it under the broiler for very quickly. Yes. you, you got to watch it. Burn that. Every year, we would distract my mom so that they would catch fire. <laughs> yeah. So we always bought two bags of Jet Puff marshmallows. <laughs> okay. And we also, cornbread, you can do it two ways. Uh, we like this a little jalapeno cheddar um, or your mm. plain corn. It's very good. Oh, that's delicious. I never I never liked the yams at Thanksgiving, as you know. That's yeah. But this, I could get behind. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. That looks delicious. How was it, guys? Fantastic. Yummy. Good? Fantastic. Was delicious. Yeah, you can, you, if you take the marshmallows off, you could kind of make it a, more like a side dish than a dessert. You don't want to take the marshmallows yeah. off that. All right. Yeah. Bingo, what do you have? Okay, what? so I'm going to make an autumn panzanella. And panzanella is basically a bread salad. Mm -hmm. So um, we're going to start with um, this butternut squash. It's, it has all sorts of fall vegetables in it. What does um, panzanella mean? What is that? It's a bread salad. She bread just salad? Yes. I'm sorry. I did just say that. Thank you, Craig. Just listen to you at home. No, there was somebody <laughs> in the studio <laughs> <was> talking. <laughs> I couldn't. Okay. Sorry, I couldn't. So you just scoop it out, and then you're going to slice it again, like, 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 sort of like you did. Into, so you peeled it? So yes. Peeled it I have selective hearing, I suppose. <laughs> That's absolutely true. Um, <laughs> little cubes mm -hmm. over here. So we right. have them all cubed. We've got some tomatoes, some Brussels sprouts. We're going to put That's some olive oil. Now, who made this? Gigi made this? Who in your family? Yes. My mom loves a good pan. Did the kids enjoy eating this around the holidays? Actually, yeah, because... And by the kids, she means you. Yeah, I mean, anything with bread in it, I'm, like, mm -hmm. I'm a big... You made, you I'm made a, a big version carb of this loader, just especially last right week. now. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so salt and pepper, and then you're going to roast these about 20 minutes or so, oh, 400 degrees, just mm -hmm. until they get kind of caramelized, um, fork tender. You don't want to overcrowd that, because then they won't get caramelized. Right. So, sure. And now we're going to fry up some pancetta, Ooh. as one would. Yeah. Um, you cube the uh, pancetta. And this will just add a little crisp to the top. If you can't get is, pancetta, could you use you could like use bacon. slab bacon? Yeah, absolutely. Mm. I just love pancetta. And this is just going to, I love like the texture of the salad mm -hmm. with the bread and the crispy pancetta. Another thing That's we're going to add, we're going to let this saute What's... for a little bit. And then we're going to add sage, which Ooh. will give it such a yummy mm. autumn. What dressing awesome. you use on this? Okay, so now we're going to make the dressing. We've got Dijon mustard right here. Mm -hmm. We'll add some red wine vinegar, some maple syrup. More How's of the, the salad? yummy fall it's flavor. It's Kevin, I finished Seriously, it. Good, right? What it's is delicious. panzanella? <laughs> <laughs> we're going we're gonna to rewind. <laughs> Just one question. Oh, Sandy. <laughs> oh, Sandy. Sandy. Um, yeah, and then you'll add some olive oil slowly. That's how it gets nice and thick. Nice. And then there, this is your bread mm -hmm. that makes it a panzanella. Yeah. Ah. Hoda, it's a panzanella. Oh, bread salad. Um, Carson, what are you doing in the kitchen while all this is? I make drink. the cocktails. Absolutely. This, if you came to my house, this Ooh. is my mother's handwriting Aww. of the recipe, which That's we so always sweet. loved her handwriting. And Siri had this made on a towel that sits oh, in our kitchen. Siri. Beautiful. Yeah. So That's this beautiful. was cool. That's and uh, it's a Brandy Alexander, mm. and I'll make it when we're done. Are you done with the salad? I'm done, yes. Go for it. <laughs> this was, yeah, yeah this is a cocktail on. that started in our household really just around Christmas for Thanksgiving, but then it became like the drink in the house. And <laughs> we use it at every celebration, birthdays mm -hmm. and whatnot. And it's a very simple recipe, as my mom has written out here. So it's always fun. We got to... It's one and a half cups of brandy to a cup of cream to cocoa. So that's the ratio. And then mm. a little, and then a cup of half and half. Mm. That's basically it. I've added, we added ice right. somewhere along the line. Uh, I added a scoop of vanilla ice cream to my mom's recipe. <laughs> oh, it's a, yeah. it's, it's also very a light. A little bow thruster. Yeah, very it, light. Uh, just a little bit. Uh, and, uh, this is good yeah. for the kids, too, right? <laughs> uh, no, this is not. Although, yeah, you can make the, the mocktail version of that. My first Christmas with the dailies, uh, I had a dangerous <laughs> amount of those. These get, know. yeah, these get going. So anyway, you, you, you do. <laughs> It should be like a milkshake consistency, mm -hmm. though. And then we take a little bit of nutmeg right on top. This Whoa. was such a big part of our family that we had a dog. Uh, we named the dog 
Brandy Alexander because it was a white little fluffy dog with a little bit of brown right here, like nutmeg, Aww. and we called her Lexi. So Aww. this this Aww. is a very, very big daily household cocktail, the Brandy Alexander. Grab your apron for a new podcast, Cooking Up a Storm with Al Roker. I forecast, yummy. Some of the best chefs spill the beans on family secrets to get you ready for Thanksgiving. This is fun. Bringing the heat for the holidays. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts.